Hi welcome back guys this is your friend, WTFW with another fiction. What if Deku descent into vigilantism now before starting please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this now let's get into the fanfic. A state of decay cover. The country? In shambles. Midoriya's personal life. Also, in shambles. It's a wonderful time. Trying to learn how to navigate an entirely new way of being a hero hasn't been easy. Vigilantism isn't all it's cracked up to be Yeah, It always sounds cool in comic books and in theory. But Midoriya is no stranger to long nights, and more broken bones, cuts, and bruises than he can count. Now, he knows why Aizawa looked like death every day in class back, when he was still in Yua. Coffee is literally the nectar of the gods, and the sun is just way, way too bright. Fortunately, Izuku's roommate more than understands the mess he's made. Underground hero Mindjack Shinsu Hitoshi is right there with him. Izuku sits on the couch with his knees pulled up to his chest, carefully nursing a mug of straight, black coffee that Shinsu handed him minutes ago. It was one in the afternoon, but it felt the same as when he woke up at five in the morning to exercise back in high school. He hated mornings then, and he hates them even more now. He's thought about reaching out to Aizawa to see how he got his hands on a sleeping bag with separated arm and leg compartments built into it. It seems nice. Are you even listening? Shinsu says, waving a hand in front of Izuku's face. You were mumbling under your breath, so I'm assuming you weren't. Izuku laughs nervously, scratching the back of his head. Sorry. Long night. He smiles at his roommate sheepishly. Well. I asked if you were going to Todoroki's birthday party tonight, Shinsu said, sitting beside Izuku on the sofa. Ashido's throwing the party, so she'll probably be upset if you don't go. Are you going? Is Kaminari going to be there? Shinsu sighs. Why are you asking both of those questions together? I don't like what it implies. I think you do, Izuku says in a teasing tone. Shinsu pinches the bridge of his nose in annoyance, but there's no hiding the faint blush that appears on his cheeks. I will be there, Shinsu finally says, and I have no clue what Sparky's plans are. I can find out for you, Izuku says, reaching for his phone on the coffee table. Shinsu smacks his roommate's hand away from it so hard that he almost knocks the mug of coffee out of the other hand. Don't you dare meddle, Shinsu warns giving Izuku a startlingly murderous look. And that's the end of that discussion. Izuku knows better than to challenge that face. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The hardest part about what Izuku does for a living is not being able to tell most of your friends. He's told them he's just an underground hero, like Shinsu. That way, they don't question his sleepy appearance and the lack of his presence in the daytime. The commission isn't all they were taught it was. Many of the heroes know this, but for fear of being arrested or stopped from being heroes altogether, they have to abide by the commission's rules and orders. Izuku couldn't do that. He just couldn't not when he knew what they were capable of and what they liked to sweep under the carpet. The first person that comes to mind when he thinks of the commission's injustices is Tamura Shigaraki. Thanks to their weird bond, Izuku knew more about Shigaraki than probably anyone else did. They could occupy the same mental space and communicate there, and they had. Izuku had seen enough memories of Shigaraki's to know that it wasn't his nemesis' fault that he ended up the way he did. Abusive father. Then there was all for one, who was even more so, and had completely warped and manipulated Shigaraki into his puppet. And while no one else was with Izuku on this, he knew in his heart that Shigaraki just wanted to be saved. Like every other time, whenever he thought about his nemesis, he could feel that bond sizzling and cracking between them, and that small part in his mind reserved for Shigaraki would tingle and burn. Izuku often wondered if Shigaraki knew it too when Izuku thought about him. Even though Izuku was always out on the streets at night, he hadn't seen Shigaraki since the war, nor any of the League of Villains members since. But Izuku couldn't just forget about him. He hates to admit it, 
but he found himself thinking of his supposed nemesis more often than he probably should. Shigaraki, a man who seemed to have a burning hate for everyone and everything, was really just a scarred and tortured soul that has never had anyone reach out to him before. It was people like Shigaraki that made Izuku do the things he did. He was tired of people falling through the cracks and not getting the help they needed and deserved. Sure, some people didn't want to be helped. But the fact that the world has only ever scorned and mocked these people is the reason Izuku wants to be the one to reach out to them. His biggest dream is to start someday a program where these people can get that help. Therapists, doctors, mentors, housing. You name it Izuku wants to give that to these people. But first, he will have to dig deep and rip out the faulty foundation that everything is precariously built upon and start from scratch. He hasn't found a way to do it yet, but the safety commission needs to go. He feels the connection between him and Shigaraki tingle in the back of his mind and wonders what would happen if he tugged on the rope that binds them. What if he reached out to him? What would his former nemesis say? Or would he say anything at all? As if Shigaraki could feel Izuku thinking about it. The thrumming of the bond was suddenly gone, and Izuku's head was quiet again. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Hey, Madabro, Kirishima calls as Izuku walks through the door of Todoroki's home. The party is already in full swing, and most, if not all, of the guests have arrived. Shinsu is right behind Izuku. His arms folded across his chest as an inquisitive eye sweeps over the room. Hey, Kirishima, Izuku greets with a big smile. He follows the redhead into the room and sits on the couch with some others. He notes that Shinso is already in the kitchen, sliding up next to Kaminari, and he smiles smugly to himself. As much as Shinsu likes to deny it, he totally has a thing for the electric blonde he's currently standing next to. There's no denying it. Izuku only wonders how long it will take them to make it official. Todoroki is seated to his left and already seems pretty drunk, even though it's only 8 o'clock. That's because Ashido keeps handing him shots, and like the agreeable person Todoroki is, he hasn't said no yet. That's it, birthday boy, Ashido says, pumping her fists in the air as Todoroki downs another shot. Then, Ashido is looking at Izuku with a maniacal grin on her face. You too, Midoriya. No one is leaving here sober tonight. And that's how the rest of the night goes. Lots of shots, some truth or dare, they manage to talk Ashido out of making them play spin the bottle. And some light dancing. The room is spinning around Midoriya as some of the girls dance around, having dragged him off the couch as well. When they're done with him, he decides he needs a bit of fresh air, so he heads out to the balcony. It's still cold outside, seeing as it's only January. Izuku leans against the railing, feeling the cold metal dig into his arms. Normally, it would be too cold to stand out here like this, but it felt good at the moment, with him being absolutely wasted and tired out from Ashido's shenanigans. In the back of his head, he feels that familiar tug, and like a moth to a flame, Izuku seeks out the connection in his head. Sometimes, when he focuses hard enough, he can feel what Shigaraki is feeling, or hear what he's thinking. It's late, and Izuku wonders what his former nemesis is doing up at this hour. Part of him hesitates, knowing it's a total invasion of privacy to look into someone's head like that. He shouldn't do it. But Shigaraki's always there in the back of his head. That connection between all for one and one for all keeping them tied together. So long as both of them hold on to these quirks, it's just how it will be. Knowing Shigaraki, he'd probably looked inside Izuku's head before. Izuku doesn't doubt it. He supposes that's what finally makes him do it. Izuku pushes out, following the invisible rope in his mind that will inevitably lead to Shigaraki. The bond's humming grows stronger the farther Izuku goes, and eventually, it grows still. Everything is quiet. Then, he's suddenly filled with emotions that he knows aren't his own. There's a stabbing pain, like an itch, that makes it hard to wade through anything. He feels something akin to regret a numbing ache that buries itself deep within his chest. 
and that itch covering everything. It's almost impossible to dig through. He can't seem to get anywhere or find anything here. Then, Izuku physically jumps, his eyes snapping open when a foreign voice suddenly fills his head. Get out of my head, the voice barks, and it's unmistakably Shigaraki's. Even though he's been ordered to retreat, Izuku lingers. He doesn't dig. He just lingers. Please, the voice says again. This time, Izuku doesn't jump. Shigaraki's tone is softer. Sad, even. It's not a place you want to be. Why? Izuku responds before thinking about what he's doing. He shouldn't be talking to him. He knows that, but still, he can't stop himself. I already told you, he responds. I've already been inside your head before, Izuku tells him. There's nothing here that can scare me away. You're wrong. Izuku knows he should stop, he really should. But he hasn't been able to talk to Shigaraki in so long, and part of him doesn't want to back down just yet. I can feel you rooting around inside my head, Shigaraki says. He doesn't sound angry, though. He sounds defeated or something. Izuku is having difficulty putting his finger on precisely what it is. What are you looking for? Nothing. Liar. Everybody always wants something. I don't need anything from you, Shigaraki, Izuku tells him. Liar. Then, before Izuku could form a reply, he's shoved from Shigaraki's head and thrown back into his own. He's cold now as he stares out onto the streets below. His cheeks are warm from the alcohol, but everything else feels colder. He can still feel the bond in the back of his head, shimmering, tempting him like a chest full of treasure. All he has to do is reach out and... Hey, Izuku, a voice says from behind him. He turns around to see Ochako poking her head out the door. Are you all right? You've been out here a while. Why, yeah, I'm good, he tells her with a smile. Of course, he wouldn't tell anyone what he was doing. No one could understand that kind of thing. It was a cross that only he and Shigaraki could carry. Izuku didn't stay at the party much longer after that. His mood had shifted into something a little more sour, and he was drunk, which was a bad combination. He said his goodbyes and went to look for Shinsu, but didn't find him. After shooting him a text, Shinsu said he was with Kaminari. Fucking finally, Izuku thinks to himself smugly. He heads home alone that night. What an entitled bastard, Tamira thinks to himself, after booting Midoriya from his mind, he could always feel the green-haired hero sitting in the back of his head, no matter what he did. Whatever stupid connection they had due to their quirks made it nearly impossible to think sometimes with all that muttering the dumb hero was always doing. Yeah, Tamura could shut him out, but that took energy to do. So, more often than not, the hero's thoughts were thrown down the bond and forced into his head. He didn't like to admit it, but he'd honestly grown used to having the little fucker there. When he did choose to block him out, he didn't like how empty everything felt. It makes it too quiet and calm, giving more room for his mind to run. And he doesn't like that. It makes him itch, like he always does, with the desire to lay his hands on people and things and turn them to dust. He hated it. But when Midoriya was in his mind, his was quiet. He could focus on whatever the hero was thinking, feeling, and doing, and it would muffle his own insufferable thoughts. What he didn't like was when Midoriya tried to root around in his head. He knows this makes him a hypocrite, but in his defense, he doesn't want Midoriya to know what he's truly thinking and feeling for fear that he'll close himself off from Tamira altogether. He really doesn't want that. Listening to Midoriya's thoughts like a late-night radio station, was the only way to get his mind to calm down and stop racing to stop remembering. Whenever he let his mind do its own thing, it always returned to the war. Like some awful horror movie, he was forced to watch himself as he did horrible things to people in the name of his master. He'd been brainwashed and manipulated, and the only person who saw it for what it indeed was was Midoriya. Right now, Midoriya was drunk. Tamira knew how he was when he got like this, 
and despite the alcohol in his system, the green-haired man's mind never slowed down. If anything, it got worse when he was drunk. Tamura lays in his bed, staring up at the ceiling, tuning into Radio Midoriya and drowning out everything else. Right now, Midoriya was having a total pity party for himself. Tamura scoffs at this, even though he knows the twerp had plenty to feel this way about. He knows everything about Midoriya. He knows what his favorite foods are and what video games he liked to play on the weekends. He knows that Midoriya is selfless and kind to a fault, even to people like Tamira. He is everything that Tamira isn't. His exact opposite. He found it addicting to sit back and listen to Midoriya's internal monologue. And though he'll never admit it, he likes that the hero thought about Tamira as much as he was thinking about him. It was interesting to hear his thoughts about him. Midoriya's view of Tamira is completely warped. Or at least Tamira thinks so. When the hero thinks about his former nemesis, he doesn't feel hate like he should. Tamira has done countless terrible things to Midoriya, and he knows that the hero has plenty right to hate him. But he just doesn't. He should. He wants Midoriya to hate him. It would make things so much easier. As he listened, Midoriya's thoughts were once again fixed on Tamira. He could hear him weighing the pros and cons of reaching out to him like he did earlier. Usually, he came to the conclusion that he shouldn't, but that changed earlier tonight when Midoriya forced his way inside. It seems that Midoriya was going to try again. That left Tamira with two choices. He could let him inside, though he had no idea what he'd say to the guy. He'd thought about it over and over and over again wondering what he could possibly say to Midoriya after everything that happened between them. He'd thought about how badly Midoriya wanted to save him, and all the ways that Tamura should convince him that he shouldn't, that he didn't deserve it. But there was always that small part of him that wanted to be saved, no matter how small it was. In this context, he didn't even know what being saved meant. Would Midoriya be his friend? How would something like that even work? because they both know it won't, no matter how badly Midoriya wants it. His second choice was to block him out entirely. But that would only leave Tamura alone with his thoughts, with nothing to lean on and focus on his indeed. He didn't want that. Midoriya was pushing against the edges of his mind, trying to find the same crack he'd slipped into earlier. Sighing, Tamura let down the shields he had around himself and let the twerp in. What do you want? Tamira called into the void. Then, something strange happens. It's like he's ripped out of his body, and everything goes dark around him. He's now standing alone in a dark and endless room. He's in that weird place now, the one that bridges their two minds together. But he doesn't see Midoriya. Hello, someone calls behind him. He knows who it is before he even turns around. Midoriya is standing there looking at him with a sheepish smile on his face. He's not wearing a shirt, and God, Tamira really shouldn't be letting his eyes wander. But the stupid twerp is toned as fuck. A pair of grey sweats hang low on his hips, showing the former villain a delicious amount of the hero's tanned body. Tamira's eyes dart back up to Midoriya's. Hello, Tamira responds, not sure what else to say. He doesn't know what he should say. What do you want? All he can do is re-ask the same question as earlier. You let me back in, Midoriya states, taking a few steps closer. Out of instinct, Tamira steps back defensively. This makes Midoriya frown, but he doesn't try to come closer again. So what if I did, Tamira bites. I don't know what I'm doing, Midoriya admits. I know. Tamira knows everything that goes through that pretty little head of his. You're also drunk he says, calling out the green-haired hero. Midoriya only chuckles, the warm sound filling and echoing through the void around them. And by the gods, if it isn't a wonderful sound. Tamira hates himself for thinking that. But how can he not? This is pretty much me drunk texting you, I guess, Midoriya chuckles. It's a lot more intimate than just a text. Tamira's hands twitch at his sides. You're inside my head. And you're in mine, too, 
the other man points out. Not like I can control it, Tamira glares. Well, we're kind of stuck with each other, aren't we? Midoriya chuckles again, and Tamira's face softens. How does the stupid twerp do that? Tell me what you're thinking right now, Midoriya says. You can figure that out yourself, Tamira replied. Tell me instead. I don't like digging around where I shouldn't be. It makes me feel bad. Midoriya's emerald eyes search his face. But whatever he was looking for, Tamira knows he won't find it. You did it earlier. Defense. That's all he can think to do put up his defenses and skate around the subject. He knows Midoriya could just reach out and take what he's looking for. But unlike Tamira, he's a good guy. He doesn't want to do that. And I feel bad about that. But I can still feel what you're feeling right now. I know there's something heavy on your mind. Of course there is. There always is. Regret. Guilt. Envy. All of it. It's always there. And there's no escape. It's always there. And Midoriya knows that. If he could truly feel what Tamira did, then Midoriya knows. Why would I tell you anything? Tamira says, keeping his defenses up. Maybe he wants to drop them, but he just can't bring himself to do it. He wouldn't know how to be vulnerable like that. You don't have to, I guess, Midoriya says with a small shrug. But I guess I'm here if you do need someone to talk to. Tamira decides he's had enough. He doesn't need to talk to Midoriya, of all people, about his feelings. The hero shouldn't care anyway. Tamira was only being considerate by keeping him at arm's length. Asterisk, 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 Izuku was suddenly shoved from Shigaraki's mind again. He laid on his bed staring up at the ceiling, his mind absolutely racing now. Also, when did Shigaraki get so hot? What the hell? He'd been wearing a black shirt and sweatpants, but the shirt was tight. It showed off his muscles. Izuku supposes he didn't spend a lot of time admiring his body back when they fought each other. But now, he has the luxury of seeing him like that. His white-blue hair was longer now, and it brushed the tops of his shoulders and hung down in front of his face. Still, he could see his crimson eyes peeking through his bangs, just as unreadable as ever. Shigaraki had been scared, among other things. He felt vulnerable with Izuku in his mind which he understood. He didn't really know what he was doing anyway, digging around and reaching out to him like that. He'd never done that before, and he supposes there's a good reason for it. Shigaraki doesn't want Izuku inside his head, and he understands that. But still he could feel Shigaraki's emotions coursing through him, and all Izuku wanted to do was reach out and hug him. He wonders when the last time Shigaraki got a real hug was. Izuku sits on the roof of a building, peering down into the alley below. He's been stalking the same guy for a while now, using him to track down someone else. Yes, this guy had also been selling and using illegal quirk enhancement drugs. But Izuku wants to know where this guy's been getting them. He plans on following the chain all the way back to the source to stop it directly from the source. This is something it had taken him and a lot of the world, a longer time than it should have to realize they needed to be cutting down villainy at its source, rather than wasting their resources on the small fish. The longer you let the sources fester and bubble, the worse it would get, no matter how many minor incidents you managed to handle. Izuku was tired of running around like a goose with its head cut off. That's how it had felt all those years before the war, and even some after when he'd intended to become a pro hero. Now, he realized you couldn't do as much as you wanted to within the Safety Commission's constraints. After learning about things like Lady Nagant and even Hawks, it wasn't an organization that Izuku wanted to work for. Hearing what they did to people made him angry. They had built up this society on unstable footing and hoped for it to remain that way. But that couldn't be allowed to be the case. As Izuku stalks the criminal, he lets his mind run unaware that someone is tuning in. Asterisk, 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 Tamura was initially surprised by Midoriya's thoughts about the commission. The little hero was a do-gooder of the highest degree, 
even believing that people like Tamura deserved a second chance. Hearing the annoying twerp rattle on in his head about the injustices of the world was fascinating to Tamura. Long ago, he would have thought the two of them to be complete opposites of each other. And he hates to admit that maybe he was partially wrong somewhere along the way. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk Kimiko, of all people, was making Tamura go to a therapist. She'd managed to find one that would work with villains. And so here he sat in some awfully 70s-looking office, waiting on his new therapist. He doesn't even know what you're supposed to talk to these kinds of people about. He doesn't think anyone would be able to help him. Yeah, he was fucked up in more ways than just a few. But how would talking to a stranger help out with that? Tamura was here to humor Himiko. Plus, she'd threatened to perform an embarrassing act disguised as Tamura. He can't have that. He stares down at the terrible, orange shag carpet, running his worn-out trainers back and forth on its surface. He reaches up and scratches at the side of his neck. It was an old nervous habit he was never really able to kick. After what felt like forever he checks his watch, and it's been maybe a minute. The door to the office opens, and a young woman walks in. Judging by her appearance, she couldn't be too much older than Tamira. With a haphazard stack of papers and notebooks in her arms and a messy bun of blonde hair on her head, she rushes in and plops down on the chair opposite Tamira, depositing the large stack of shit in her arms on the floor with a thud. So sorry I'm late, she says, stretching her hand out to him. Got stuck in a meeting. I'm Katsumi Ono. You can call me whatever you like. Tamira eyes her outstretched hand curiously, wondering if this woman even knows who he is. She looks at him and waits, and he finally understands what she's doing. This is a game. A test. She's waiting to see what he'll do. Tentatively. He reaches out and takes her hand, shaking it gently as his eyes narrow at her suspiciously. She doesn't shake in his grasp, nor does her facial expression falter. Is she really not afraid of him? Tamura Shigaraki, he greets as she lets go. You think I should be afraid of you, she states, not easing into the conversation with meaningless pleasantries of any kind. You should be, he says, his voice low. A warm tingle spreads in the back of his head, suddenly alerting him of Midoriya's presence, but he shoves it back. Not right now, he thinks to himself. Why? Are you going to hurt me? Tamira pauses, stopping himself before another harsh response leaves his lips. I don't think you're going to, she says before he can formulate a better response. Her golden eyes search his face for something but ultimately settle back on his eyes. She leans back in her chair. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want help on at least some level. My friend made me come here. Tamira scratches at his neck and doesn't stop when he feels the telltale sting of his fingernails breaking through the skin. Ah, yes, Himiko Toka. She's a good friend. She wants to look out for you. Tamira nods. He knows that much is true. Regardless of what anyone thought about the weird girl, even after the war, she'd remained one of his close friends. They were like family now. Do you always do that when you're anxious? Ono asks, pointing the pencil she was holding at Tamira's neck. He instantly drops his hands into his lap, but he can feel the tickle of blood on his neck. It's just a nervous habit, he tells her. Ono writes something down on the notepad in her lap. Tamira frowns. What are you writing? He asks sharply. Just some things, she says, looking at him briefly to share a small smile. Nothing important. If it's about me, I want to see it, Tamira states. She sighs. If you're not going to work with me, I can't work with you. I don't even want to be here in the first place, Tamira bites, leaning back into the brown corduroy sofa. Your office is ugly, by the way. She raises an eyebrow at him before writing something down again. He can't see it. But at this point, she's just scribbling nonsense into the notebook to mess with him. Seriously, what are you writing? You trying to diagnose me after only knowing me for like 15 minutes. Are you afraid? 
This question stops him in his tracks. When the villain remains silent, she probes further. Why are you so afraid of losing control over things? Wouldn't you like to be able to relax? He scoffs and promptly stands up from the stupid, scratchy sofa. We're done here, he spits, his crimson eyes burning into hers. She gives him another warm smile. Same day and time next week, she states. I promise I won't be late next time. Asterisk, 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 Tamira pulls the hood of his black sweatshirt over his head as he walks back to his house. Yeah, Tamira has a house now. It turns out that All for One had some significant investments, and somehow, his money defaulted to Tamira upon the villain's death. He supposes it has to do with how the fucker intended to take over his body, not because All for One actually cared about Tamira or anything as tedious as that. A foe didn't care about anybody but himself. That much was obvious. This meant that he wouldn't have to steal and fight anymore just to stay alive. It was a significant change, and he and the others were still getting used to it. He, Himiko, Dabai, Aguchi Spinner, and Atsuhiro Compress all lived in a house together now. It was always chaos there, but Tamira wouldn't have it any other way. He was glad to be able to provide the people who chose to remain at his side some semblance of normalcy after everything that went down. It was the least he could do. With his hands still in his pockets, he enters the house. The sounds of an argument immediately hit his ears, and he follows the voices, finding Dabai and Himiko standing over a fried PlayStation console. That's the second one that month. Tamura sighs and waits in the doorframe, letting the two argue it out. He knows better than to get involved at this point. All I said was that it was my turn, Himiko says, stomping her foot. You get to play your dumb shooting games all day long, but you never let me play what I want to play. Well, now neither of us get a turn, Dabai bites back. And whose fucking fault is that? Himiko shrieks before turning on her heel to head out of the living room. She stops when she sees Tamura. Oh, hi, Shiggy, she says, her face instantly morphing into a tooth, rottingly sweet smile. It was scary sometimes how fast she could change her emotions, but Tamura was used to it. How did therapy go? I won't be going back, he says dryly. Whatever. I still have a vial of your blood. Don't make me use it, she says, sticking her tongue at him. Tamura rolls his eyes at the girl and heads past her. He's already pulling up the link to order a new PlayStation on his phone. Yeah, they'll just wreck it again but it keeps them happy for the most part. Atsuhiro, formerly known as Mr. Compress, is in the kitchen, putting a kettle on the stove. Hello, Tamura, he greets. I'm making tea. Would you like some when it's ready? I'm fine, he says. How did your outing go? Atsuhiro asks, as he turns the burner on. Fine. Tamura kept walking through the kitchen and to the stairs. He just wanted to be alone. He didn't want to talk to the others right now, even if they were being nice. He had other things on his mind right now. Atsuhiro says something else, but he tunes it out as he heads up the stairs. He lays down on his bed and stares up at the ceiling, trying not to scratch at his neck. Allowing his mind run was never a good idea, but for once, he let it. He thinks about the therapist he'd just met. She should have been afraid to touch his hand, but she wasn't. He didn't know why this was. She'd also accused him of being afraid of things that were out of his control. He didn't know how true this was, but the statement still bothered him. Yeah, he preferred it if he was the one in control. He'd spent too much time working for other people, doing their bidding, and quite literally being controlled by them to give up control now. He eventually decides that letting his mind run isn't going anywhere. Instead, he follows the slight tingle he feels in the back of his mind and opens himself up to it, letting Midoriya's thoughts flow freely through his mind. The little hero must have been watching a movie or something because he was mumbling over some plot, theorizing, and putting pieces together about what would happen next. Tamura listens in 
and lets Midoriya's train of thought drown out his. This wasn't a typical dream Izuku knew that much as he wandered around. He stands in that weird in-between place again. But Shigaraki is nowhere to be seen this time. The only sounds he can hear are his breathing and his steady pulse behind his eardrums. Suddenly, a loud ringing fills his ears. He covers them with the palms of his hands, his face scrunching in displeasure. But the covering does nothing. The empty landscape around him is shifting and changing, and all he can do is squeeze his eyes shut as everything swirls and makes him feel nauseous. Then, there's a hand on his shoulder. You look like shit, someone says behind him. He already knows it's Shigaraki before he even turns his head and opens his eyes. The ringing in his ears has subsided a little, but his stomach is in knots, and his vision is a little blurry. I feel like shit. Izuku says as he tries to stand up. His legs are failing him now, and he drops to his knees. Shigaraki does nothing but watch as Izuku struggles to gain his footing. Once on his feet, he takes a second to look around at the new landscape that formed while he was down. It's Yua. It's not just any memory of Yua, it's where he was when he faced Shigaraki for that second time, when the school was lifted into the sky. His heart is racing now as he takes in the scenery around him. Everything has been paused. No sounds come from the open mouths of his former mentors and heroes. There's some rubble frozen in the sky, and... Bakugu. Best genist kneeling over him. The blood. There was so much blood on his childhood best friend's face and body. The awful churning Izuku feels in his gut only increases when he sees this. He doubles over, only realizing now that he's in his old, tattered hero costume, back when he still wore green. He opted for black now. He looks back at Shigaraki, who appears to be taking in the scene around them. They seem to be the only moving parts of the dream. Shigaraki's eyes find Izuku's, and for a moment, the green-haired vigilante can see the panic in his eyes. Izuku tries to calm himself but he feels like he's going to throw up. He doesn't know why he's having this dream. He hadn't been trying to connect with Shigaraki before he went to sleep or anything, so he had no idea why the connection was open now. He wants out. He wants to wake up. He tries the methods that usually help him wake up from lucid dreams, but nothing seems to work. You're muttering under your breath, Shigaraki states. Shut up, Izuku wheezes. You're a lot less agreeable than you used to be, Shigaraki says, stepping closer to the doubled-over hero. Agreeable? You want me to be agreeable? Sweet and doe-eyed and nice, like I always used to be, Izuku spits. No, he couldn't be that kid anymore. That kid was so naive. The kid that used to idolize the life of a hero was no longer him. He'd always had such hope in his heart. But it was memories like this that caused him to falter and shy away from the light. How could he show himself to the public after something like this? It didn't matter if the good guys technically won. They'd lost so many lives. And the safety commission was still there, calling shots from the shadows. So, who really won? Because Izuku sure as hell didn't feel like they'd won the war in the long run. If that's what you wanted, then you shouldn't have done any of this. Izuku hisses, motioning to the scenery around them. All the memories of how he'd felt upon seeing Kekin's body on the ground so lifeless were coming back to the surface. He knows he never really got over this stuff, instead opting to push it down and forget about it. The fact that he'd done so was coming back to bite him in the ass right now. You know it wasn't me, Shigaraki responds. I was used. My friends were used. We were pawns just like you, little hero. Shigaraki's hands clench into fists at his sides. Izuku takes a deep breath, trying to recenter himself. He knows it's not Shigaraki's fault, at least not this battle. At this point in time, all for one had almost complete control over the man standing in front of Izuku. Shigaraki opens his mouth and closes it abruptly, as if to stop himself from saying something. Izuku has thought about this moment for years. He's always thought about how he'd address his and Shigaraki's past together 
if ever given the opportunity. He'd like to say that he's forgiven the villain. But being here again, and seeing all of the carnage that had taken place before he'd been able to get there makes his heart twist and ache in his chest. Feeling that ache, Izuku has an idea. He knows that Shigaraki doesn't like him poking around inside his chest. But maybe he could just reach out down the bond and see how Shigaraki was feeling right now. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Izuku wakes up with a gasp and shoots up in bed. His body is covered in sweat and his hands are shaking. He recalls the dream he just had. All the memories and feelings he had regarding Shigaraki were now sitting right on the surface and he couldn't wipe the sentiments from his system. He doesn't want to go back to sleep, either. Izuku was no stranger to nightmares about the war, but that one was different. It was lucid and way more intimate. It was on a whole other level. He checks the time on his phone, seeing it was nearly midnight. Sighing, he gets out of bed. He intended to wake up from his nap around eight to patrol the streets. But now, he was having a hard time keeping himself upright. He pads across his room and grips the edge of his desk, the halfway point between his bed and the bathroom. His stomach was still churning, so he took a moment to relax and calm himself down. In the back of his mind, he feels the telltale tingle of his bond with Shigaraki. Part of him wants to ignore it, but the other half debates letting the villain in. Izuku's mind was running too hard and too fast and maybe a distraction wouldn't be so bad right now. He relents, and lets himself follow along the metaphysical rope that binds him to his former nemesis. The dreams are new, Shigaraki says as soon as he has an in. Did you do that on purpose? And no, Izuku tells him. His knuckles turn white from the force of his grip on the edge of his desk, and he watches as a few beads of sweat drip down onto the surface below him. I didn't do anything. I didn't think so. Izuku sucks in a breath when the bond between them opens up even further, and Shigaraki's emotions fill him. Regret, disgust, grief, and so many other things. Izuku feels terrible for saying such mean things to Shigaraki. His nemesis had been right. Izuku hadn't been acting like himself at all at that moment. Where before, he'd seen someone who needed saving. Just moments ago, he'd looked at the same man like he deserved to die. When Izuku knew that wasn't true. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, but I just don't know what to say now that we are, Izuku tells the other man. After everything that happened between them, it should be easier than this. He should know what to say and do. But he just doesn't. I don't think there's a right way to go about talking to the person who essentially wrecked your life. Shigaraki finally responds after a few seconds of silence. Izuku is no longer shaking and can stand upright now, no longer using the desk to support his weight. I still hate you. I hate how forgiving you are. I hate that you don't hate me. And before you say anything, I already know what's going on in that pretty little head of yours. You don't hate me but you should. I could never hate you for what someone else made you do. Izuku says without missing a beat. Shigaraki goes quiet for a while before their sizzling bond goes quiet again, once more turning into nothing but a warm buzz in the back of Izuku's mind. He heads to his bathroom and splashes some cold water over his face. I might not be back for a couple of days, Izuku tells his roommate as he puts on his hero costume. It's altered from when he last wore it publicly. Hatsume still designs his stuff, and has helped him do a complete redesign, opting for darker colors this time around. His arm braces were now black with dark green accents, but he still rocked the red and black shoes and the black leg braces. The suit was black with darker green accents on the sides where the other colors used to be. This way, he could be a lot more stealthy. The green stuck out like a sore thumb. Why is that? Hitoshi asks. There's someone I've been tracking for a while. Izuku says as he adjusts his leg braces. Hitoshi is getting himself ready for his legit underground hero shift, securing his capture scarf over the top of his black hero costume. I can't say much about it just yet, but I promise I'll let you know how I'm doing when I can. 
It would be better if you could let someone know where you were going, Hitoshi says. I would do that, but I can't. You know that, Toshi, Izuku tells his roommate. The last thing I want is to put anyone else in danger. Besides, I need this person to trust me if they're who I think they are. Izuku was no stranger to befriending villains nowadays. Yes, he still did some hero work, taking down those who deserved it. But he was starting to realize that he might actually get more done from the inside. Some people and groups dedicated themselves to taking down the safety commission. Yeah, they were classified as villains, but he was curious to see if these groups were real. He'd only heard a bit of gossip while doing his patrols and was tired of not making any progress by himself. He needs to do more. Even if they were classified as villains, if Izuku decides to take a stand against the commission, that would inevitably get him labeled as a villain, too. There was no workaround. He just has to keep his morals straight and get through this without compromising who he is as a person. He has his convictions, and the villains have theirs. If their purposes align briefly, then Izuku would take advantage of that. Doing what he was doing now didn't seem to get him anywhere. He was ready to take more significant and purposeful steps toward his goals. Asterisk, 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 Izuku's search had to start somewhere. And he had an idea of where that might be. Stain the hero killer. Once upon a time, Izuku would have loved nothing more than to put this man behind bars. But he finds himself thinking more and more like the villain every day. While he disagrees with Stain's methods, the villain had seen through the commission's bullshit sooner than anyone else had. There were corrupt heroes out there. Everyone knew that now. That's why Izuku had turned away from the legal hero track and decided to slip into his own methods of getting justice. The system just wasn't working anymore. His search takes him to a small bar on the bad side of the city. While order and control were starting to fall back into place, many places still couldn't be policed. Villains and gangs ran the streets in these places, where he heard he might find Stain. He steps through the establishment's doors and is immediately surprised by the atmosphere. Not only that it's the man behind the bar that he wasn't expecting to see. Kirijiri. The place is clean and well-kept, and while he recognizes the faces of a few shifty characters, nothing else is out of the ordinary about this place. It's a clean and well-lit place that looks more like a cafe than a dilapidated old bar he would expect a villain to run. Huh. The shadowy portal man was behind the bar, making drinks and handing them to a blonde waitress. When the girl turns around, it's a face he'd recognize anywhere. Well, if it isn't Deku, she says, the corners of her mouth pulling into one of her famous, killer grins. Izuku freezes, not sure what to say or do. We heard about you, you know. Not a hero anymore. Who would have guessed? Toga, dear, please don't scare away our patrons, Kirijiri says from behind the bar as he uses a drink shaker. Have a seat anywhere, Deku. You're as welcome here as anyone else. Strange, Izuku thought. He admits he spent much time wondering what became of the League of Villains after all for one's defeat. He guesses he got his answer, though some other members were nowhere to be seen. Shigaraki, for instance, isn't with them. And neither is Dabai or Mr. Compressed. He wonders if they split up or what became of them. Deku, you're muttering. I can't hear you. Are you going to sit down or keep staring at me? I don't mind either way, Toga says. Oh, um, before he responds, the blonde woman grabs his arm and pulls him to one of the bar stools at the counter. Thanks, he says as he takes a seat. He orders a drink, and Kirijiri starts to make it, while Toga slides into the stool next to him. Where'd that smile go, huh? she asks, pointing to the corners of her mouth. Poor little Deku doesn't smile anymore. Toga, leave the poor hero alone, Kirijiri says from behind the bar. Toga pouts. Izuku tenses up at the use of the word hero. Please don't call me a hero, Kirijiri, sir, Izuku says quietly. 
His nerves are going haywire as he sits at the bar, unsure what to think about this whole thing. These people were once his only target, but now they were talking like they were old friends. Izuku didn't understand it. He was sure they'd have it out for him if he ever ran into them again. But that wasn't the case. He just doesn't understand. What are you, then? Toga asks as she spins around on her bar stool. She grabs the counter every time around, using it to push off and gain speed. Just watching her makes Izuku dizzy, so he stares down at his folded hands on the countertop. I'm still trying to figure that out, Izuku admits. Things are really messed up right now, and I'm trying to figure out where I fit into all of this. Messed up is an understatement, Toga says, coming to an abrupt stop. He and Toga sit in silent agreement as Izuku thinks about everything. It's odd agreeing with someone he used to hate. It was true. Things were incredibly messed up. He doesn't even know if anything he's doing can fix it. But he wouldn't be Izuku if he stopped trying, or, at least, that's what he told himself. Kirijiri pops the drink he ordered on the counter before him, and Izuku thanks the villain. Do you mind if I ask you a question or two? Izuku says, breaking the small silence that had grown between them. Anything for you, Toga says, drawing out the last word in a sing-song tone. Do you still keep tabs on the others from your group? What are they up to these days? Why are you asking? Toga says in a teasing manner. Not looking to capture Shigi, are you? Capture Shigi, uh, no, Izuku says, stumbling over his words. Shigi must be her nickname for Shigaraki. I was only curious. We're all still together, Toga says. Or at least, those of us still alive. No twice. She winces and looks at the floor, obviously missing their former member. Izuku remembers this Hawks was responsible for killing the man. Izuku winces, too, as he thinks about it. Killing has never been his mo when going after villains. And someone like Twice, like any other member of the League of Villains, deserved a second chance. He won't get that now. We all live together, like old times, she says with a sad smile. We're family. Family. It makes the green-haired hero think of his friends and family, all of whom he keeps at arm's length nowadays. He doesn't tell many people about what he does. His mom thinks he's just a regular underground hero. The same with most of his old classmates. Knowing that he had to tell someone about the things he does, his roommate, Hitoshi, knows, and so does his former teacher, Shouta Aizawa. Other than that, no one knows what he's up to. That's nice, Izuku says honestly. This is a nice place you've got here, too. He looks around the space again, admiring the clean, well-lit space. Usually, You'd only find dingy and dark places open at this hour. It was a nice change from where he usually staked out and visited during patrols and villain hunts. Thank you, Kirijiri says. You're welcome by any time. It was weird being welcomed here by these people. But he supposed it made sense. Izuku wasn't a hero anymore. Izuku sat at the bar for a while longer, chatting idly with Toga. Well, it was more Toga talking with Izuku listening, but he didn't mind. A few other patrons came and went while he was there, and he never saw Stain. Izuku considers asking Kirijiri and Toga if he'd ever been in before, but he refrained from doing so. He didn't want them to think he was only there to use them after how nice they'd been. Plus, he didn't mind the thought of coming back at a later date. Maybe he'd get to talk to the other members of their group in the future. He would like to see how they are doing. After about an hour or so, he heads out, his cheeks warm from the two drinks that Kurajiri had made him. He heads for the rooftops to hit the next stop on his agenda. You just missed him, Himiko shouts as soon as Tamira steps into the bar. Missed who? Tamira replied, taking a seat at the counter. Izuku Midoriya was here not even ten minutes ago, the blonde tells him. She picks up the two drinks Kirijiri just made and heads to the tables in the back, where a couple of patrons sit. Tamira tenses up at the news Himiko shared. Why would I care? 
Tamura says when the blonde returns to the bar. You always get so weird when I talk about him, she says. Then, she turns to Kurajiri. The funky-looking guy by the window wants another margarita, she tells the bartender, who in turn begins to make the drink quietly as they continue talking. I don't get weird, Tamira says, shooting Himiko a look. Yes, you do, she chides. Do you have a crush on him or something? I wouldn't blame you. He's a real cutie. Tamira rolls his eyes, not even giving her a response. That statement was utterly absurd. In what world would it make sense for him to have a crush on Izuku Midoriya? Besides, Tamira has never felt anything like that before. He assumed he'd know if he felt that way about someone, as it would be an unfamiliar emotion. So he knew he didn't like the little hero. No way. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. He had another therapy session in an hour. When Tamira got up and put on his shoes and jacket, he wasn't sure what had gotten into him. He heads out the door and begins to walk to the other side of town, remembering what happened last time. He lets out a breath and clenches his hands into fists at his sides. He figured it couldn't hurt to go to one more session. Plus, it would make him echo happy. Maybe if he kept doing the whole therapy thing, she'd let up about the Midoriya thing. Ever since that night in the bar a few days ago, she kept bothering Tamira about the green-haired hero. She said he'd chilled out a lot since the last time they'd run into him, but Tamira knew that. He was inside the twerp's head, 24-7. He knew the idiot was on some stupid mission to find people to help him take down the commission. Tamura shakes his head at that thought. Midoriya was many things, and he supposes that Naive was one of them. If he thought that any villain would be willing to work with him, he was sorely mistaken. All he had to do was look at the last time someone tried to change things up. Everything ended in a mess, and the commission somehow ended up on top. Tamura knew this was an uphill battle that the green-haired hero wouldn't win. But he knew that Midoriya wouldn't abandon this dream for anything. He was passionate and caring, and just wanted the best for everyone. Someone needed to remind the little hero that he couldn't save everyone. That sometimes it was okay to take a break and just exist. That's what Tamira has been trying for the last few years. Having sworn off villainy, he's just focused on himself and his friends, trying to forget about the past. It was hard, though, given that he constantly had Midoriya's thoughts broadcasted in his head. But he was doing his best to move on. Midoriya needed to move on, too. He wanted Midoriya to be happy, as sick as it sounded coming from Tamira. He arrived at the front door of the therapist's office. It was in a nicer part of town, and Tamira pulls the hood of his sweater over his head, feeling entirely out of place. While he wasn't actively wanted anymore, he still didn't like people recognizing him. He didn't like how people pointed and stared at him and his facial scars. The office itself wasn't a super nice-looking one, but he assumes that a more reputable office wouldn't really allow people like him to get therapy there. People had standards, and people like Tamira didn't measure up. Tamira checks in at the desk, and the receptionist sends him back. Miss Ono should meet you back there in a few minutes, she tells him. He's now back on the familiar and ugly corduroy sofa, staring down at the orange, shaggy carpet. He wonders if his therapist picked the decor. If that's the case, he might have to rethink meeting with her altogether. It was terrible. Only a crazy person would decorate a space like this. The door opens, and Katsumi Ono rushed inside, much the same as last time. She's tweaking a bright purple pantsuit with her blonde hair pulled back in a braid. Hello, you, she said. I'd say I'm surprised you showed, but I'm really not. She takes a seat in the chair across from him and pulls out her notebook. How have things been since the last time we talked? The same as always, he states. He picks at his cuticles and keeps his eyes on his hands. Again, he doesn't know why he's here. He knows this shit doesn't help. And how's that? She prods. I'm not sure how to answer that. Tamira tells the therapist as her golden eyes bore into his. Well, 
How did talking last time make you feel? Mad. Mad, she said, pushing him even further. Tamura really didn't like this woman. What was she trying to get out of him? Yes, mad, he bites. Your assumptions about me were incorrect. Incorrect how? You said, I don't like feeling out of control. Ah, that. I still think it holds up. No, it doesn't. Tamura knows there's truth in that statement. But he doesn't like that this woman could take one look at him and seemingly know anything about him. He was more complicated than that. He couldn't figure himself out. So what made this lady think she could have him figured out in that short amount of time? You're disintegrating my couch, she said, pointing her pencil at Tamura's hands. He instantly lifted his hands and assessed the damages. Two ashy-looking handprints were on either side of his thighs. I'm sorry, he said instinctively. That didn't happen much anymore, but it did on occasion when he was upset. It's fine. I hate that sofa, she said with a smile. Tamira nodded in agreement when she also told him she hated corduroy and the color brown. Maybe she wasn't so bad after all. What's your favorite color? She asks him, entirely out of the blue. Tamira thinks about it for a second before answering. Green. Why? It's calming. It reminds me of peace and safety. Green is calming. You wear a lot of black. So what? Why don't you try wearing more green? Maybe it'll help if you carry something with you that makes you feel calm, like a sweatshirt or a pair of shoes. It helps some people. Tamira shrugs. He doesn't like to wear a lot of color. He avoids doing anything that will make him stand out even further. He already had the appearance of a villain with his white hair, red eyes, and scars, so people were bound to stare. He didn't want to give people any more reason to stare at him and pick him out of a crowd. But maybe green shoes wouldn't be so bad. He needed new shoes anyway. Asterisk, 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 Tamira slides, the pair of shoes across the counter toward the cashier, who eyes him warily. He's literally holding cash and is going to pay, so he doesn't know why the dumb teenager is looking at him like that. Maybe it's just my face, he thinks. He's never found himself particularly attractive. Growing up, he was never taught hygiene, having been raised by a literal supervillain. In the last couple of years, he started taking better care of himself. But there were still scars on his face from the war, and on his neck from all the scratching he did when he got nervous. He was pale, too, which made him stand out. He knows he's not good-looking, but still hates it when people look at him like that. Tamira pays for the shoes, and the cashier shoves the box into a plastic bag before handing them over to Tamira. When he arrives home, Himiko immediately takes the bag from Tamura's hands before he can react. He pinches the bridge of his nose as she digs through it, pulling out the shoes a pair of green converse. Aw, and here I thought you brought me back something, she says with a pout. She hands the shoebox back to Tamira. You don't usually wear color. What's with the green shoes all of a sudden? Then, she looked at him with a devious grin, and a light bulb seemed to light up in her head. It doesn't have anything to do with a certain hero, does it? She said. They're just new shoes, Himiko, Tamura grumbles. He tucks the box under his arm and pushes past her toward the stairs, ignoring the stupid warmth he can feel on his cheeks. No, of course, the shoes have nothing to do with Midoriya. Yeah, green is Midoriya's color, but that has nothing to do with the fact that green is also Tamura's favorite color. Himiko was just being ridiculous. He sits on the edge of his bed and pulls the green converse from the box. After putting them on, he looks down at his feet. He can't deny that they remind him of a certain hero. But no... That has nothing to do with why he originally bought them. You're not messing with me, right, hero? The masked villain says. He's leaned against the wall in the alley, sizing up Izuku, who stands there with his hand on the back of his head. Not messing with you, he replies. He may be a bit too chipper, but no matter how hard Izuku tries, he's always had a hard time acting like a villain. I, um, I mean, 
I heard about your cause and stuff. And I want you and other people to know that I sympathize. I want to help out however I can. The villain scoffs. I've been trying to go about it by myself. But it hasn't worked out, Izuku tells the villain, opting for complete honesty. He realizes he might not get too far if he's not. He doesn't like hanging himself out to dry like this, but it's all he can do now. I've turned in my hero license and everything. I want to help however I can. The villain crosses his arms over his chest and eyes the green-haired man. I believe you, but my friends won't, he says. Izuku's face drops. But there might be a way you can help prove your loyalty. Really? Izuku replies. Whatever it is, I'm sure I can do it. Like I said, I want to help. Suddenly, the tingling bond in the back of his head grows more assertive, and a voice filters through his mind. You don't want to get mixed up with them, he's told by Shigaraki. Izuku is thrown off for a moment, not knowing that Shigaraki has been listening in. It made him wonder how often his former nemesis was doing that. Regardless, he shoves Shigaraki back into the corner of his mind and focuses on what's happening right now. Give me your number, and I can reach out to you when everything's set up, the villain tells him, holding out his phone. Hesitantly, he takes it and enters the phone number for his burner phone. Thank you for trusting me, Izuku says before taking off. He finds a rooftop to lie low on for a bit, making sure he hasn't been followed. Still. He won't go back to his and Hitoshi's apartment tonight. Sometimes, he prefers to stay in hotels or other places for a while to make sure he's not being tailed. The last thing he wants is for Hitoshi to be put in danger because of what Izuku does. Once in a secluded place, he tunes back in on the bond and lets Shigaraki back into his head. He might as well hear whatever his former nemesis wanted to tell him earlier. Shigaraki Izuku calls down the bond. Midoriya, he responds. You're being an idiot right now. Do you even know who that was? Enlighten me, Izuku sighs. He knows the people he's talking to aren't exactly as straight-edged as he is, but it doesn't matter. If it gets him closer to his goal, he's willing to take the leap. I can hear what you're thinking right now, and no, it's not worth it, the former villain tells him. Why? What do you know about him that I don't? You're talking to someone who used to think exactly like what you're thinking now. Izuku pauses, considering Shigaraki's words. Then, Shigaraki continues. You have your convictions, and you might think that what you're doing is good. But it's not worth getting mixed in with people like that. I used to want things like that. I used to seek help from people I thought were on the same page as me. And look where that got me. Why are you trying to help me? Izuku asks. Because you're making a foolish mistake like I did once. What are you not understanding, little hero? Izuku lets out a sigh and thinks about it. If anyone understood what was happening, it would be Shigaraki, despite their differences. Maybe he should listen. But then again, this was the first time that Izuku had felt closer to his goals than he had in a really long time. What would you propose I do about this, then? Izuku finally asks. Let it go. Just let it go and live your life. Move on. You know I can't do that. I know. But I'm still going to tell you. You don't have to listen to me. But it's your funeral. It doesn't matter what your reasoning is. If you're willing to do bad things to get what you want, that makes you a villain. You're the one who taught me that, little hero. This makes Izuku pause. Shigaraki wasn't wrong. But no. Izuku knows what he's doing. He just has to keep his own motives and convictions straight. And he would be fine. He just can't forget the why. If he had to tow a few lines here and there, it was a small price to pay for peace and security. Come to the bar, Shigaraki says suddenly. You're obviously not thinking straight. This isn't like you. And you know me. I know more about you than you know about yourself. Izuku scoffs at this. There is no way Shigaraki was actually trying to help him. And he didn't know anything about Izuku. Just come to the bar, please, Shigaraki says, 
his tone softer this time. Please. Fine. Izuku stands back up and pushed Shigaraki from his mind. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk to Mira is pacing before the counter, while Himiko and Atsuhiro stare at him curiously. Don't be nervous, Atsuhiro tells him. It's your fault you went and invited the guy here, Himiko tells him. I had no idea you two were even talking. This is so exciting. You should have given me some warning so I could have worn something cuter. Shut up, Tamira says, pausing to plop down on a bar stool. Give me something strong, Kirajiri. The man behind the bar complies, sliding a shot of whiskey across the counter and into Tamura's open hand. He downs the shot and doesn't choke on it at all, instead relishing in the way it burns as it goes down. Hopefully, that will help calm his nerves. Inviting Midoriya to the bar was his last-ditch effort to get the stupid hero to listen to him. He'd met the villain he was talking to before and he was confident that Midoriya had no business getting mixed up with the likes of them. They probably lied about agreeing with Midoriya's cause just to get the poor guy to work with them. He wouldn't put it past the villain. You owe me a shot glass, Kurajiri states, pulling Tamura from his thoughts. He looks down at his hand and sees a pile of ashes on the counter in place of the shot glass he'd been holding. Damn. Second time that week he'd lost control. Whenever it came to the dumb hero, he seemed to lose it. Just the thought of Midoriya, who used to be so righteous and happy, possibly sliding down the same path he did years ago, made him angry. For the longest time, Tamira felt nothing but numb. He'd supposedly been saved from all for one by Midoriya. But after everything happened, it didn't feel that way. It took Tamira a long time to see it for what it was. You excited for your first date? Himiko teases. You really need to shut up, Tamira bites. This is not a date. Then what is it? I don't know, Tamira snaps. Just let me think. Why had he really invited him here? What was he going to say to the hero when he arrived? He hadn't had a plan when he asked Midoriya to come here. And now, he was supposed to talk the dumbass off the ledge he'd been standing on and he had no idea how he was going to do that. Wow, you're really down bad, huh? Himiko says. And Tamira can do nothing but sigh. This has nothing to do with any of that. This is about something else entirely. But you're not denying it. You're down bad. I am not. Tamira cuts himself off abruptly when he looks toward the door, and Midoriya is standing there with a blank expression. Hello, Midorita says shyly. A faint red blush spreads across his neck and cheeks as he scratches the back of his head. Tamura can't deny that the hero looks good in his hero costume. He always liked the green better, but Midoriya looked good in black, too. His face was like he remembered from the dream. While he was older now, Midoriya still had round cheeks that no amount of aging would take away and a certain boyish quality that made him look positively cute. His freckles were something else entirely. They almost seemed darker now than when he was a teen. Tamura realizes he'd gone quiet as he stares at Midoriya. Hello. You can sit down, little hero. No need to stand there with a dumb look on your face. He didn't intend to sound so mean. But he looked away, motioning for Kirajiri to get him another drink. No taking it back now. Midoriya sits next to a very nervous Tamura at the bar. Kirajiri had made them both a drink, but neither of them had spoken yet. Himiko and Atsuhiro sit at a table a short distance away, pretending not to be watching, but Tamura knows better. Himiko loves nothing more than to bury her nose in Tamura's business. Midoriya is focused on the drink in front of him, his gloved finger tracing the top of the glass. Tamura takes another sip of his drink, silently thanking Kurajiri in his mind for making it strong. So, Midoriya says, breaking the silence. You got me here. What did you have to say to me? Tamura opens his mouth, but all the words he'd planned to say shrivel up and die on the tip of his tongue. He isn't sure what to say to Midoriya. 
All he knows is that he doesn't want the man to make the same mistakes that he did. You don't smile anymore, Tamir says. He isn't sure why that's the first thing that leaves his mouth. There's not a lot to be smiling about these days, Midoriya replies. Tamira glances at the green-haired hero seated next to him. Noticing the faraway look in his emerald eyes, Midoriya's eyes used to be full of so much passion and warmth. It was something that always drew Tamura in, even when he claimed he hated the hero. But now, there wasn't a hint of warmth in those eyes. He hated this fact and wanted to do something to fix it. But someone like Tamira wouldn't even know where to start. He hardly smiled himself. Isn't that like your whole thing, though? Save everyone with a smile or something like that, he replies. Like I said, there's not a lot to be smiling about. Midoriya had yet to look at Tamira, instead keeping his faraway gaze fixed on some point behind the bar. The hero takes a swig of his drink before setting the glass back down on the countertop with a light thump. His gloved hand flexes around the glass. Tamira puts his hands in his lap as he feels the telltale itching sensation in his palms. If he's not careful, he could disintegrate something by accident again. He could feel his heart thumping in his chest. And if he didn't get himself under control soon, the drink on the counter would be nothing but dust. You can't always fix everything, Tamira finally states. You're not going to be able to control every outcome all the time. Sometimes, you have to know when to quit. I can't quit, Midoriya says, clenching his jaw. Yeah, I might not be able to fix everything, but the second I quit is the second they win. I can't let them win. As long as I'm alive, they need to know that there's at least one person out there who's willing to do what it takes to put a stop to their crimes. Tamira digests Midoriya's words. He's not sure what he can say to the hero anymore. Midoriya has the same sense of justice he's always had, except this time, he's all on his own. He's a strong hero, but it will take a lot more than one person kicking and punching their way through the streets to take down an entire system. How about this? Tamira starts. I'll help you, but only if you promise to stop trying to contact other villain groups. Midoriya's head whips to the right, looking at Tamira with a shocked expression. But Tamira is just as shocked as the man next to him. Shiggy, you can't be serious. Himiko says from the other side of the bar. Tamira looks over to his friend, forgetting she'd been listening at all. He waves a dismissive hand at her. Does he really want to help Midoriya? No. But if it keeps him from making bad mistakes, he'd do it. He doesn't know why he's feeling so adamant about this, but it's the only thing he can think of to keep Midoriya out of trouble. Midoriya doesn't know it, but it's a slippery slope. The minute you start sacrificing, even a fraction of your morals to reach your goals, you're lost. The things you're willing to give only get bigger and bigger, and the pieces you cut from yourself and give to the cause only get larger and bloodier until there's nothing of you left. You don't mean that, Midoriya says, looking back to his drink. You all seem to be doing well. I wouldn't want to mess any of this up. I don't want to mess it up, either, Tamira tells him but I don't want to see you mess yourself up, either. Tamira wishes that Midoriya would just listen to him and stop it altogether. He doesn't know why, but the thought of the hero tearing himself apart for a cause like this makes his chest hurt. He knows it's a fruitless effort. There's nothing the hero can do all by himself. So, if the only thing Tamira can do is at least watch out for the hero, he'll do it. I'll think about it, Midoriya finally says. You're not leaving here until you give me an answer. You don't really want this, Shigaraki, Midoriya says, looking back at Tamira. His green eyes sweep across the ex-villain's face. This is my battle. I don't need anyone else getting involved or getting hurt because of me. Who looks out for you, then? Tamira finally snaps, raising his voice, his crimson eyes piercing into the man next to him. When you're out there, all alone, Shoving everyone and everything away, who watches your back? Who makes sure you get home safely? And not even that, but you'll never see the world you want. The best you can do is stick to normal hero work. Do what you can. 
You can't control everything, and you can't save everyone. I thought you, of all people, could understand that. But I can try, Midoriya says, his voice small. Even though the heroes technically won in everything, it feels like nothing's changed. Midoriya takes another swig of his drink, finishing off the contents of the glass. At this point, Tamura doesn't know what he can say to the hero sitting next to him. He looked down at his hands that were around his glass, stared at the new pile of dust on the counter, and cursed under his breath. Sorry, Kirijiri, he says, sweeping the pile off the counter. The man behind the bar says nothing as he replaces Midoriya's and Tamura's drinks. Midoriya utters a quiet thank you before sipping the new drink. I don't know what to tell you, Tamura says quietly. I don't know what to say other than that you'll run yourself into the ground. Change isn't going to come in this lifetime, so you're just wasting your time. I... He trails off, unsure if he wants to say the next part out loud. I don't like to see you feeling so down. I don't want to see you get hurt anymore. Midoriya meant more to Tamura than he knew, and more than he liked to admit. Midoriya saved him, and allowed him to have a second chance at life. And now, Tamura felt like this was his chance to repay him. He wanted to save Midoriya from making a terrible choice, but he didn't know if he could. Midoriya seemed sure of what he wanted, and there didn't seem to be any stopping him. Is there any way I can convince you to just... Stop? Tamura asks. He already knows the answer to this, but there's no harm in asking. No. Fine. Have it your way. But you're done talking to villains about this shit. They don't care about you or the greater good or whatever you want to call it. Tamura says the last part with finger quotes. You have any more idiotic ideas? You run them by me. End of story. Or I'll put a stop to you myself. Got it. Midoriya rolls his eyes at Tamura. Fine. If you want to help, I won't stop you. It was a small compromise, but at least it gave Tamura an in. If anything, this gave him another chance to convince the hero to stop. Tamura was going to do what he could for now, and at least someone would be keeping an eye on the idiot. Izuku leaves the bar and instantly takes to the rooftops. He finds a nice, secluded place to sit and think about what happened. Since when did everything get so? Fucked? Once upon a time, it would have been Izuku trying to convince Shigaraki not to do villainous things. But now, it was the other way around. And how fucked is that? Izuku knows, this is the only way he might get what he wants. So why was Shigaraki so adamant that Izuku not do this? There's no way that his former nemesis could possibly understand. No way. He sighs and sits on the edge of a tall building, letting his feet hang over the edge. The night air is crisp and chilly, and the wind this high up whips past his ears, causing them to turn numb and red. Down below, the city is alive and moving like always. It's almost three in the morning now, so there aren't many cars, but the city is still awake with sounds and movement. He sighs and flexes his hands in and out of fists, trying to calm his racing mind. Tamura Shigaraki. His mind turns and twists as he considers everything that's happened in the last few years. At the end of the war, Izuku was able to take down all for one and stop the mind-melding thing that he was trying to do to Shigaraki, effectively giving him a second chance at life. Izuku had no idea whether Shigaraki would take that chance and improve himself. But by the looks of it, he and his former League of Villains were doing all right. They had made some kind of small life for themselves and weren't acting as villains anymore. The thought made Izuku's heart twist in his chest. Even the villains could find peace and happiness after the war. But Izuku was stuck. Things never seemed to get better, and he felt trapped under the obligation to fix everything. He would never escape these obligations. It was quite literally his purpose, as the holder of one for all to be a symbol of peace for the people. But Izuku, like since the beginning, feels like he's a failure. Like nothing he's done since receiving the power has actually done anything to change the world. If All Might was still alive, 
Izuku wonders if he'd be disappointed. He probably would be. Izuku's smile has been gone for ages. He used to think that he could just bring hope to people by saving them with a smile on his face like his former teacher. But no. With the way things currently were, Izuku couldn't do anything right. Everything felt empty now, and like hell, he'd work for the safety commission. Knowing the things about it that he did. If he worked for them, he felt like he was just becoming a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. The only problem was that he couldn't even find a good solution. Izuku, by himself, wasn't enough to stop what was happening. He couldn't just go in there, punching and kicking. All that would do is get him painted in the light of a villain. Politics had never been Izuku's strong suit, so there just didn't seem to be a clear path toward anything. Asterisk, 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 a week passes, and Izuku still hasn't heard from that villain he talked to on the street. Even though he told Shigaraki he wouldn't contact them again, part of him is still angry. Nothing he was doing even seemed to matter. No one cared. Why did no one care? He sits down in the shower and lets the hot water hit his back and head. His knees are pulled to his chest, and he rests his chin on the tops of his knees. He just feels so frustrated and doesn't know what to do about it. He's tense all the time now. His mind seldom thinks of anything else. He just doesn't know what to do anymore. He can feel tears pricking in the corners of his eyes and furiously rubs at his face, not wanting to break down over this. He can't afford to. Yeah, he doesn't smile anymore. But that doesn't mean he gets to cry, too. He suddenly feels the tingle of his bond with Shigaraki come to like in the back of his mind. And before he can push it away, Shigaraki's voice fills his head. You're sulking, Shigaraki says. And you're spying, Izuku retorts. I don't think it's spying. Izuku rolls his eyes. Besides, you've seen almost all of my traumatic memories, Shigaraki reasons. You probably know more about me than anyone else out there. So why don't I get to look around in your head a little? It's only fair. Izuku only rolls his eyes again and doesn't give Shigaraki a response. You know, I can feel you rolling your eyes at me. Just get out of my head, Izuku grumbles. I don't think I will. Please? You're begging. Now? I kind of like that, Shigaraki says, and Izuku can hear the amusement in his voice. A silence passes between the two of them. And although they're both quiet, Izuku can still feel the persistent thrumming of the bond in the back of his head, tethering his mind to Shigaraki's. I'm going to therapy, Shigaraki finally says after a while. Really? Izuku asks, his interest peaked. Shigaraki was really serious about getting better, and Izuku liked that. He wanted to think that at least one thing he's done in the past has mattered and helped someone. I've gone three times now. Do you think it's helping? Izuku prods. I was going to suggest that you go to therapy. You seem to need it. Rude. But I appreciate you thinking about me, I guess, Izuku pouts. Never in a million years did Izuku think that a former villain would suggest he go to therapy. Izuku gets out of the shower, and Shigaraki gives him the contact information of the same therapist he goes to. Izuku puts the information into his phone. Unsure whether he's actually going to do that. You can also have my phone number if you want it, Shigaraki says before telling him that piece of information as well. I suppose it's not as efficient as whatever the mental bond thing is, but you can still have it. And just like that, Izuku now has the phone number of one of the worst supervillains in Japan's history, and the villain's therapist. Everything just felt so ass-backward, but so be it. He dries himself off before wrapping his midsection in a towel. He doesn't even have the energy to dress himself for bed before he flops down on his mattress. He can still feel the tingle of the bond in the back of his mind, and it's strong enough that he knows Shigaraki is still listening to his thoughts. Even so, he lets his mind run. It's likely that Shigaraki has been listening to his thoughts for a far longer time than Izuku was aware of. To Izuku it doesn't feel like it matters anymore. Shigaraki can poke around all that he wants. Asterisk, 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 
Shigaraki stares down at the green shoes on his feet. He sighs, realizing that maybe Himiko is right. Maybe he only liked the color, because it reminded him of Midoriya. Shigaraki likes to justify it, saying he only thinks of Midoriya when he looks at the shoes because Himiko said something in the beginning. But he doesn't know how true the sentiment is. He attended another therapy session last week. Miss Ono commented on his green shoes and seemed happy that Shigaraki was actually listening to her suggestions. This week, he was given another task. He was supposed to start carrying around a pocket-sized journal she gave him every time he felt anxious. She said it was supposed to help him identify his triggers since she wanted him to stop scratching his neck. At first, he thought the idea was stupid. But as he started actually to do it, he realized that it might actually be helping. Anytime he feels like scratching, he instead pulls out the notebook and writes down what's happening around him or in his head. So far, he's still scratching, and he doesn't always remember to write things down when he feels anxious. But it's a process. He hates to admit that other people are right. But maybe Himiko was onto something when she made Tamura go to therapy. If it can help someone like him, he thinks that it might not be a bad idea for Midoriya to try it, too. He hates that Midoriya doesn't smile as often as he used to. And he also hates to admit that it bothers him more than it should. Tamura really shouldn't care, but he does. And he hates it. It was late Wednesday afternoon, and Izuku found himself sitting on a remarkably ugly brown corduroy sofa. He ran his hands over the fabric while waiting for the therapist to arrive. Izuku had been running late, but the therapist, Katsumi Ono, seemed to be running even later. He runs his hands over the couch, and his fingers catch on a part of the fabric that feels different from the rest. Looking down next to his thigh, he sees a part of the couch that's been damaged in the shape of a handprint. On his other side, there's another one. He puts his hands in the handprints, lining up his palms and fingers in the pre-existing shapes. While his hands were a bit wider than the ones that left the prints, his fingers were slightly shorter. As he got around to thinking about the kind of quirk that might leave handprints like that, the door opened, and a woman rushed into the room. I swear to God, it's always something, she huffs. So sorry I'm late. The woman takes a seat across from Izuku. After dropping an abnormally large pile of books and papers on the floor next to the chair, she has long, blonde hair that's being kept out of her face by a purple bandana. She's wearing a purple dress with a black cardigan. She holds out her hand and introduces herself. I'm Katsumi Ono. You can call me whatever you like, she says with a smile. Izuku takes her hand and shakes it. Izuku Midoriya, he says. It's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, so, what brings you here? She asks as she pulls a notebook from her stack of books. She taps a pencil on the pages, and her golden eyes search Izuku's face. Um, well, a friend, or not a friend exactly, I guess an acquaintance recommended I go to therapy and suggested you. But I don't really know what I'm supposed to say or do. I've never really... Hold it, she says, smiling, cutting off his word vomit. You're Tamura's friend, aren't you? Well, I just want to start by saying that it's normal for heroes to go to therapy. There's nothing shameful or wrong about it, she states. The fact that you've come at all shows a willingness to work on yourself, which is more than a lot of others can manage. Izuku nods. He knows many heroes who could benefit from something like this, but would never stoop down and actually accept the help. It's not that Izuku felt shamed for coming here. It's just that he can't even iterate his thoughts to himself, so he wasn't sure how he was even supposed to start something like this. He runs his hands over the prints on the couch again, trying to center his thoughts. His mind was racing, and he wanted it to stop. I can already tell you're an overthinker, Miss Ono says. You probably have a hard time calming your mind enough to sleep and stuff, yeah? That's right, Izuku says with a slight nod. Well, I can give you the cliché answer and tell you to do some breathing exercises when you feel like that. 
but I have a feeling that won't work for you. She writes something down in her notebook, and Izuku is curious about what it is. He feels he's hardly said a thing, but she's already drawing conclusions about him. Still, he says nothing. How often do you spend time with friends? I try to do it as much as I can, but I'm either busy or too tired most of the time, Izuku responds honestly. With how often he's out at night, he mostly sleeps during the day when all his friends are awake. This gives him even less time to hang out with them. He's on his own a lot of the time, he realizes. What makes you tired? How are you sleeping? Well, I mostly do my hero work at night, so my sleep is all over the place. She writes something down in her notebook. Have you considered switching to working in the daytime? It might help your sleeping schedule. With the work that I'm doing, it would be impossible to do it in the daytime, Izuku responds. Villains are more likely to be active at night, so if he wanted to connect with any of them, he needed to be up at night. He wasn't interested in going back to standard hero work, since it didn't seem to help anything anymore. I know I don't know anything about what you do, but I'd really like to recommend that you work during the day and sleep at night, she states. Or, at least offset your schedule a little bit, so you're working half the amount you are now, so that you can fix your sleeping schedule at least a little bit. I don't know if I can do that. He scratches the back of his head as he thinks about her words. At the moment, it didn't seem like something he would be able to do. He needed to work nights. There was no way around it at the moment, not with the direction he wanted to take his hero work. Okay, we'll table that for now, but I'm also going to suggest you try to spend more time with friends. If things start getting to be too much, or your mind starts to run, just have someone you can call and talk to about things. Izuku runs through a list of his friends in his head. The last thing he wants is to be a burden to any of his friends. He can't think of anyone he could talk openly about this stuff with. He wouldn't want anyone to worry. I don't want to worry my friends, he tells the therapist. She taps her pencil on her bottom lip. If they're your friends, they will want to help you, she says. I understand your concerns, but I can pretty much promise you that if they care about you, they'll want to help you. I don't need help, Izuku thinks to himself. He just needs to get his thoughts under control. The last thing he wants to do is make anyone worry on his behalf. Plus, pretty much none of his friends know the extent of what he's been working on. There's no one he can talk to about these things without giving too much away. So he really wasn't sure what he was going to do. By the end of the session, she's given Izuku two missions. Find someone he can talk to about this stuff and start keeping a journal. Whenever his mind is running, she wants him to fill a whole page with his thoughts, claiming it might make him feel better if he's at least able to get them out of his head and onto paper. He thanks Miss Ono and leaves the office, unsure if it helped. When Izuku gets home, he sits at the desk in his bedroom with a new notebook in front of him and a pencil in his hand. He taps the writing utensil against the page, wondering what things he should write. After he finally starts, he just lets his thoughts flow onto the page with no rhyme or reason or breaks for paragraphs. Before he knows it, he's filled a whole page with random thoughts. It's things about work, about his friends, and about Shigaraki. Part of the page is filled with his worries about being a burden to his friends. He really doesn't want any of his friends to worry about him. They all have their own things going on seeing as pretty much all his friends are heroes with their own traumas from the war. Yeah, they'd understand where he's coming from, but that's just it. They probably have many of the same thoughts as him. None of them are coming to him with their concerns, so why should he burden them with his? It wouldn't make sense. He wonders why none of his friends have wanted to talk about things for a while. Maybe it's Izuku's fault for not reaching out to them. Perhaps they don't trust him to talk about these things, or maybe they feel the same way he does. Regardless, he knows that he can't reach out to them. All it would do is cause needless worry. His problems seem to have no solution. 
And the last thing he wants to do is shove those worries onto someone else. He just can't. He lets out a deep breath as he looks over the page, admitting to himself that it's at least a little bit satisfying to see his brain vomit on a page. Izuku bound up the villain exceptionally well with the zip ties he kept in his belt before phoning the police. He then took to the rooftops just above, where the villain was bound to keep an eye on him until the police could arrest him. Izuku couldn't be seen by the police because what he was doing was also technically considered illegal. Vigilantism wasn't something the safety commission wanted people to do. There were others out there like Izuku, but they mostly stuck to the rougher parts of town, where the police and other heroes were still having trouble getting under control. After the police come and collect the villain, Izuku moves on, watching the streets from the rooftops. As he leaps from a relatively tall building to a short one, using float to ease his way down, the burner phone in his pocket dings. He lands on the soft gravel on the roof and pulls the phone out. It's a random number, which isn't atypical for messages on this phone. But it's the message that makes Izuku tense up. My friends are ready for you, hero. Are you ready to prove yourself? Below that, there's a date, time, and location attached. They want to meet him in an abandoned warehouse tomorrow night. He's excited that this is his first real lead toward his goal. But he pauses. He can already hear Shigaraki nagging him about what he's going to do. He also told Shigaraki that he wouldn't. Izuku doesn't like to break promises. But Shigaraki doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. Izuku feels excited for the first time in a long time, knowing this might get him one step closer to his goal. But then he feels it the tugging of the bond in the back of his head. Shigaraki is listening. He knows it. Izuku pockets, the phone right as Shigaraki's voice fills his head. What did I tell you, little hero? Izuku remains silent, but doesn't block Shigaraki out like he thought about doing. If you plan on doing anything, you promised you'd let me help, Shigaraki says. Don't tell me you break promises too. Now, I never said I was going to do anything, Izuku defends. You forget I can hear everything you're thinking right now. Izuku groans and sits down, running his hands through his hair. Was he not allowed to make his own decisions now? Was Shigaraki really going to start monitoring his thoughts? I will if I can't trust you to make the right choices, Shigaraki says. Confirming that, yes, he is always fucking listening. You're essentially long-distance babysitting me, Izuku pouts. If that's what you want to call it, then yes. A slight pause in their conversation occurs before Shigaraki speaks up again. You're still thinking about their offer, he grumbles. Are you really about to throw all your morals out the window for the possibility that they're being honest? Are you really that stupid, little hero? Okay. Since you seem to have all the answers, what do you suggest I do? Izuku fumes. He pulls at his hair, feeling more frustrated by the minute. Give up. You know I can't do that. I know. Shigaraki's tone is soft and understanding. Izuku takes a deep breath and tries to relax a bit. He needs to think about this logically. He always tends to let his emotions get the better of him. But he can't do that. Not with something like this. He has no idea what these villains want him to do to prove himself. It could literally be anything, and he needs to be careful. He hates to admit it, but Shigaraki may be right. Izuku is wrong, and his former nemesis is right. Finally, Shigaraki says, Are you understanding? You're not going to like where any of this takes you. Even if it's your only choice. It's not worth it, little hero. Izuku lets Shigaraki's words wash over him as he thinks about everything. He gets what he's saying, but that doesn't mean he likes it. He's been prepared to make some questionable moves all this time, but maybe it isn't worth it like Shigaraki says. After all, what would that make him in the end? Yeah, there's a slight chance that what he does will make the world a better place. But in the end, he'll have no place in it if he sacrifices his own morals to make it happen. It would make him no better than any of the villains he faces. 
One of the most significant differences that Izuku notes between heroes is not the ideals they hold, but how far they're willing to go to see their ideas come to fruition. If he was willing to do questionable things to see his goals through, that didn't make him a hero. Maybe Shigaraki was more correct than Izuku thought he was. If anything, Shigaraki would know all about making questionable choices. I can hear your rude thoughts, Shigaraki chimes in. Sorry. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk Tamira felt slightly satisfied in his efforts to get Izuku to calm the fuck down. He understood where his little hero was coming from, but his little hero? Since when did Tamira start referring to Midoriya like that? He shook the thought from his mind, not paying it any attention. If anything, this was a small win. While he was no longer conversing with Midoriya, he could still hear the little hero's constant stream of thoughts pouring through his head, and Tamura knew that he had made a little impact on how he saw things. That would have to be enough for now. He heads down the stairs to the living room. Himiko is playing Stardew Valley on their recently purchased gaming console with her feet on the coffee table. Tamira sits beside her, zoning off on the screen while he listens to Midoriya's thoughts. It's late at night, so Tamira should probably be sleeping. But he didn't like to leave Midoriya to his own devices, so he'd slowly found himself adhering to the hero's sleep schedule. To make it short, Midoriya's sleep schedule was garbage. Tamira felt like garbage, too. But even if he tried to go to sleep, he often found himself staying awake until the hero was at least home. It was apparent that Midoriya wasn't doing too well, and it seemed that Tamira was the only one looking out for him at the moment. He hates it. It makes him think about Midoriya's other friends. Their class at Yua always seemed so close before and during the war. They fought at each other's sides and all that stuff. But where were they now? Tamira couldn't recall a time in the last few weeks when Midoriya had reached out to any of them except the one he lived with. He'd gone to that party a few weeks ago. But aside from that, the kid seemed to be all on his own. He knows that Midoriya has a savior complex, which could have everything to do with it. He might not want to plague his friends with all the awful thoughts he's been having. That was probably it, knowing the stupid hero. If there's anything that Tamira learned through everything, it is that having friends by his side was everything. After the war and the death of all for one, he and the former members of the League of Villains stuck together. Having his friends there for him in the aftermath of everything was probably the only reason he was still not in prison or still alive. It was starting to look like Midoriya didn't have that. Whatcha thinking about? Himiko asks, pulling Tamura from his thoughts. Nothing. He crosses his arms over his chest and puts his feet up on the coffee table. I know you better than that. You're glaring, she said, leaning over to poke Tamura's forehead. He bats the woman's arm away. Remember the other night when Midoriya was in the bar? Yeah, you missing your boyfriend or something, she teases. Himiko, I'm being serious, Tamura says, shooting her a deadly look. She bites the inside of her cheek and pauses her game, then turns to face her friend. What about it? He's going through some stuff, and he's thinking about making some really bad choices, he tells her. She listens intently, leaning her arm across the back of the sofa. So, you're worried about him, she notes. I guess so, Tamira says, reaching up to scratch at his neck, but stopping himself and running his hands through his hair instead. Tamura doesn't even know where to begin when it comes to Midoriya. He thinks back to himself before the war. If anyone had tried to tell him he was wrong back then, Tamura wouldn't have listened. So, how did he get where he was? What was the breaking point for him? How could he help his little hero before it was too late? Tamura quickly throws on his shoes and jacket before sprinting out the door. Midoriya had blocked Tamira from his thoughts a little over 15 minutes ago, which wasn't good. It was something he rarely did, and because the dumb hero had been invited to meet with villains just minutes from now, Tamura could only guess why he was being blocked from his mind. Midoriya didn't want Tamira to know what he was doing. 
Little did the hero know that blocking him from his mind told Tamura everything he needed. Tamura takes to the rooftops in search of the stupid idiot, trying to remember which warehouse Midoriya was supposed to meet them at. His former nemesis had not been thinking this through. For all the hero knew, this could be a trap. But he was still jumping right into things, even after his talks with Tamura. He uses the search quirk to pinpoint Midoriya's location and finds that he's on the other side of the city from Tamura. He tries to push down his anger as he follows after the twerp, summoning his wing quirk to get there even faster. He starts to head toward Midoriya in hopes of reaching him before he makes contact with the villains. By the time he arrives at the warehouse, Midoriya is already there. Tamura perches by a window where he has a pretty good aerial view of what's happening inside. He's still closed out of Midoriya's mind, so he cracks the window open to hear what's happening below. You actually came, the villain scoffs. Tamura tries to get a good look at the villain, who's carrying a large sword on his back. It makes him curious about this villain's quirk. His face is covered, so Tamura has no idea if he's met this guy before. You told me to come, so I did, Midoriya responds. His voice comes out steady, but Tamura can tell that the hero is nervous by how he fidgets with his arm braces. And so you did, he chuckles. You're so gullible. I hardly had to say anything, and I had you eating out of the palm of my hand. Midoriya tenses up, and Tamura can see the green lightning form on the hero's body as he takes a readying stance. Tamura sees it before Midoriya does, and before he can even think about what he's doing, he jumps in from the open window. The rivet stab quirk coming from his fingers to block the attack of someone trying to hit Midoriya from behind. Midoriya's eyes meet his former nemesis briefly before he turns around to block the attack of the villain who lured him there. In the blink of an eye, more than ten villains are ready to take on the hero. Thankfully for Midoriya, he has backup. Even as powerful as the little hero is, it's easy to get overwhelmed when fighting so many people simultaneously. In a silent agreement, Tamura and Midoriya stand back to back, ready to face the threat together. While the green-haired man fights behind him, Tamura trusts the hero to have his back, while he focuses his energy on the villains he can see. You said he'd be alone, one of them shouts, obviously spooked by Tamura's presence. Tamura holds out his hand and lets off an air cannon blast, sending three villains into the steel wall. Unfortunately for Tamura, the impact was enough to harm the integrity of the structure they stood in, and the building started to shake. They continue to fight off the villains for a moment before the ceiling above them falls. Tamura is again acting before he can think, and he grabs Midoriya a little haphazardly. Using his wing quirk, he flies them from a small gap in the door right before the building crashes to the ground. Plumes of dust and debris fly out behind them knocking them to the ground. Tamura holds Midoriya in his arms, tightly wrapping them around the hero's body as they bounce across the pavement. The building shifts behind them again, and more dust comes flying from the structure. Keeping Midoriya tight against his chest, Tamura uses his air cannon quirk to push the dust and debris back, keeping them out of the aftermath of the collapse. I had everything under control, Midoriya says. Like hell you did. I just saved your ass, Tamura retorts. They're still pressed together on the pavement, Tamura's arms seemingly glued around the hero's body. They're both breathing heavily, trying to catch their breath after the harrowed escape from the structure. The building came down because of you, Midoriya scrambles away from Tamura, lifting himself onto his feet. Before Midoriya can get too far, Tamura stands up and grabs his arm, pulling him close again. Midoriya is scowling at him, but he doesn't care. He's safe. Relief washes over him as he holds on to Midoriya. You should have listened to me, Tamura says, softening his tone. Well, in hindsight, yeah, Midoriya says, still on the defense. He squeezes his eyes shut and clenches his jaw before trying to speak again. I, I didn't know. I wasn't thinking. Tamura could tell him that he never thinks before he does shit like that. 
He wants to say a whole list of mean things to the brat right now. But he holds off on doing so. He looks down at the hero in his arms. He looks so fragile to Tamira much more so than he'd ever seen Midoriya look. His eyebrows were pressed together, and the hero's body was shaking. I know, Tamura says softly. It's okay. He swiped his thumb across Midoriya's cheek, clearing away the blood from a deep scratch along his cheekbone. Then, he runs his hand through the hero's green hair, clearing it of dust and debris from the now felled structure. All it takes is one look Midoriya gazes up at Tamura's knowing eyes once, and the hero breaks. Midoriya buries his face against Tamira's chest, grabbing handfuls of his shirt in his shaking hands. He lets out a loud sob, catching Tamura by surprise. All he can do is hold Midoriya now, but he's unsure whether he's supposed to do anything else. He's never had to hold someone like this before. No one has ever been this vulnerable with Tamira before. I, I just wanted, Midoriya tries to speak between sobs but his words come out broken and cracked, stabbing Tamira through the heart like shards of glass. I know, little hero, I know, Tamira whispers into Midoriya's hair. He snakes his arms around the other man's waist and holds him close, letting him cry against his chest. The building behind them shakes again, and Tamura is suddenly worried that not all of the villains were taken out with the wreckage. He runs a hand through Midoriya's hair before pulling away from him a little. He grabs the hero's chin and lifts his face, showing Tamura a set of heartbreakingly sad, emerald eyes. We need to get out of here before the police arrive, he tells him. Just hold on to me, okay? I'll get you out of here. Midoriya nods before wrapping his arms tightly around Tamura's neck. Tamura slides his hands along the backs of Midoriya's thighs, lifting the hero's body so that he's fully wrapped around him. Then, Tamira summons his wings again and lifts off from the ground, carefully supporting Midoriya's weight. He flies through the air and takes them a block or so away from the wreckage before touching down on a rooftop. The wind howls against Tamira's ears up here, but he doesn't care about that right now. The wings at his back disappear before he leans back against a wall, still holding the hero in his arms. He slides down until he's sitting, and once he's seated, Midoriya buries his face against Tamura's shoulder, still sobbing. All Tamura can do is hold him and let him cry. He wishes he could do more, but Tamura's never been in this situation before. He partially understands how the man in his lap is feeling, but that's the extent of it. He's never had to calm someone down like this before. So, he continues to hold him tightly, occasionally running his hands through Midoriya's green hair which seems to calm him down. After a few minutes, the sobbing stops. Midoriya, who's still straddling Tamura's waist, looks at the former villain with a dejected expression. Neither of them says anything. Tamura wants to say something, but he just doesn't know how. He's not sure what he's supposed to say to someone who's been crying. He's afraid that saying something will only make it worse, so he keeps his mouth shut. Instead. He closes his eyes and pushes against the bond in his head, letting Midoriya know he'd like inside. The hero relents, breaking down the wall he'd erected between the two of them inside his mind. Once inside, Tamura still doesn't say anything. Nothing he can say right now would be able to properly express what he's feeling toward Midoriya right now. Deciding to forego words altogether, he opens up to him emotionally letting his feelings wash over the broken hero in his lap. It's feelings of reassurance, worry, and relief that he's okay. He only wants Midoriya to know how relieved he feels that Midoriya is safe. At this point, Izuku is just letting Shigaraki take complete control. He no longer wants to do anything. He doesn't want to try. It felt like the one thing he'd been hoping for and banking on for a while now had slipped between his fingers and he could do nothing about it. He hates that Shigaraki was right. He absolutely hates it. He wanted to give these people the benefit of the doubt, but all they saw was an opportunity to ambush him and take him down while he was unprepared. Shigaraki was taking him somewhere again. After calming him down on the rooftop, 
He'd whispered something to Izuku, but he hadn't been listening. He was too lost in his thoughts and the emotions that Shigaraki was washing over him. He tried the dumb breathing exercises to get his brain to stop, but it wasn't working. Instead, he was clinging to his ex-nemesis like his life depended on it, trying to focus on nothing else but the foreign emotions coursing through him. They were a comfort blanket of sorts, and it was interesting to Izuku that Shigaraki felt this way at all. He thought the man would want to gloat and rub it in his face that he was right about these villains, but instead, he only felt cared for. He could feel how Shigaraki felt toward him, and it was throwing him for a loop. Never in a million years would Izuku think that Shigaraki would be relieved that Izuku was okay. For a long time, they'd both wanted nothing more than to see the other one dead. But everything was different now. Everything was so different. Shigaraki touched down in front of a nice-looking home. His wings rescinded into his back, and he started walking them to the front door. This must be where Shigaraki lives. Before Shigaraki could carry him through the door like a damsel in distress, Izuku started to move, and Shigaraki let him down. They stood there facing each other for a moment before the taller of the two spoke up. I thought maybe you could stay here until you're feeling better, Shigaraki says, rubbing the back of his head. His crimson eyes look everywhere but at Izuku. Just to hang out, or whatever. I didn't want to leave you by yourself. Um, yeah, okay, Izuku responds. He fidgets with his arm brace, adjusting the spot in the crease of his elbow. I should warn you, though, Shigaraki says as he pulls a set of keys from the pocket of his black jeans. If Himiko is awake, she's probably going to be annoying about me bringing you here. Just ignore what she says for the most part, and you'll be fine. Right, okay, Izuku says readying himself for what might be behind the door. And with that, Shigaraki opens the door. The entryway lights are dim, but as they head into the central part of the house, the living room is well lit. Sitting on the couch are Toga and Dabai, who snap their heads up to look at Izuku upon his entry. You finally brought your boyfriend home to meet us, Toga says, throwing her remote down on the couch beside her before jumping over the back of the sofa. He's not my, Shigaraki starts, but Toga cuts him off. Yeah, whatever. And damn, you guys look rough. Where did you go? Who'd you fight? She peers curiously over Shigaraki's shoulder at Izuku, who offers a small wave. Let's not talk about that right now, okay? Shigaraki says firmly. He's holding on to Midoriya's arm, whose face is beet red. He's still reeling over the fact that Toga had called him Shigaraki's boyfriend. The bond between them instantly snaps closed, and Izuku can no longer feel the comforting weight of Shigaraki's emotions in his chest. Everything feels just a little too light, a little too fast, and his head is swimming with his own thoughts and emotions at an alarming rate. Shigaraki bats away Toga before dragging Izuku toward the stairs, who follows along without giving him much trouble. Toga is still firing questions at them as they ascend the stairs but Shigaraki doesn't respond to any of them, and Izuku takes that as a sign to keep his mouth shit as well. He's led into a room, and as soon as the door is closed behind them, Izuku lets out a battered breath. The former villain flips on the light, illuminating the room behind them. His eyes are looking over Izuku's face, who's curiously trying to look over Shigaraki's shoulder at the room. He assumes it's Shigaraki's bedroom, and he's really curious to see what kinds of things the ex-villain keeps in here. Nosy, HM, Shigaraki says, reeling Izuku back in. It then hits him that he's standing in Shigaraki's room with him. Alone. And he's standing really close. Izuku doesn't know why. But that makes his ears warm and his head feel slightly fuzzier than it already is. Earth to Midoriya, Shigaraki says, waving his hand in front of Izuku's face. Are you feeling okay? Feeling any better than earlier? Um, yeah, I guess so, he says. Not really sure what else to say. It's weird how attentive Shigaraki is acting, and Izuku doesn't know how to handle it. You should take this off, Shigaraki says, grabbing the collar of his hero suit 
and Izuku's ears burn even harder. He brushes a hand over Izuku's chest, knocking off some dust and debris from their earlier escapade. You can have a shower, too, if you want. I can give you something else to put on. Izuku only nods, still feeling a bit weirded out at how nice Shigaraki is being. Yeah, they've been talking about their bond for a while, but this was different. He was acting as if they were friends. Were they friends? Is this friend stuff? What did Shigaraki think? He didn't know since the other man had put up the walls that separated their thoughts. And it's not exactly the kind of thing that you can just go and ask someone. You're muttering, Shigaraki says, and Izuku's eyes snap to where the other man is digging through a drawer in his dresser. He returns to where Izuku still stands by the door and hands him a set of clothes. He nods his head toward the bathroom attached to the room, and Izuku obeys, heading inside. He closes the door behind himself and locks it maybe overkill. But oh my gosh, I'm showering in my former nemesis' home. This is so weird. Then starts to remove his hero suit methodically. First are the arm and leg braces, and then he unzips the top half of the onesie. He can hear Shigaraki moving around on the other side of the door, and he can't help but wonder what he's doing out there. Izuku squeaks when a voice suddenly fills his head. Just relax and quit muttering, he tells Izuku. I can hear you through the door. I can smell the fumes coming from your ears. Right, sorry, Izuku responds sheepishly. Once his hero suit is in a heap on the floor, he turns on the shower and hops in. Asterisk, 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 Tamira lays down on his bed and rubs his temples. He's still not 100% sure why he brought Midoriya here. All he knew was that he wanted to calm him down and didn't want to leave him alone. It was apparent that Midoriya didn't have many people looking out for him. If Tamira needed to be that person, then so be it. He listens to Midoriya's inner monologue as he showers to ensure he's doing okay. He's mostly just freaking out about the situation at hand, which is understandable. Internally Tamira is freaking out a little bit, too. Bringing people to the house wasn't something that he or anyone else who lived there did. It was their safe haven away from everyone else. And even though none of them had talked about it, they were all under silent agreement that they wouldn't share this place with anyone else. Well, that was before Tamira brought Midoriya home. But the hero was spiraling, and Tamira didn't know what else to do. He closes his eyes and lays his head down on the pillow before crossing his arms over his face. He listens to the sounds of the shower running in the next room over. He'd probably take a shower, too, once Midoriya was done. Then, Tamira found himself blushing when he thought about the stupid hero wearing his clothes. He'd given Midoriya one of his sweatshirts and a pair of his grey sweatpants, and for some silly reason, the thought of his little hero wearing his clothes came across as way more erotic in his head than it should have been. But then again, Midoriya looked good in anything he wore. He had a nice face, Shigaraki thought, as far as faces go. The freckles were a nice touch, and he looked cute when he... Oh. Oh. Did he have feelings for Izuku Midoriya? His cheeks were burning now as he thought about the man who was taking a shower in the next room over. Midoriya steps out of the bathroom, steam rolling out of the small room behind him. Tamira sits up, trying to forget every thought previously running through his head. But then he looks at Midoriya, who's standing in the doorway wearing the black sweatshirt and grey sweatpants that Tamira gave him. His hair is still wet from the shower, and Tamira does not he reiterates does not watch as a drop of water slides down the hero's neck before disappearing into the sweatshirt. He realizes he's been staring when Midoriya's blank look changes into one of confusion. Tamira shoots up from the bed and grabs the change of clothes he picked out for himself before walking past Midoriya and into the bathroom. I'm going to shower, too, he tells Midoriya. Make yourself comfortable. I won't take long. Then... He amends his statement. And no snooping, please. All right, the hero replies softly. And Tamira shuts the bathroom door. 
He checks to ensure the mental block he put in place is still there before letting out an unsteady breath. Literally nothing had changed in the last 15 minutes nothing. Except Tamira's stupid brain had to make a bunch of conclusions about how he felt about Midoriya. And suddenly, he couldn't look at the brat without his pulse skyrocketing. It was stupid. He leans against the shower's tile wall and lets the hot water hit his back. Taking in a few deep breaths, he remembers that the hero is still sitting right outside the bathroom, and he is going to have to talk to him. He was going to act like his heart wasn't racing and that nothing was the matter. Midoriya already had enough going on. He didn't need this, too. All Midoriya needed right now was a friend, and Tamira wanted to be that for him. He knew how necessary his friends were to him while he was going through a bunch of stuff. It was obvious that Midoriya didn't have much in the way of a safety net to fall back on when things got hard. So, Tamura would have to step up and be that for him. It's the least he could do after the hero pretty much handed him a second chance at life after everything he did. He was surprised that Midoriya trusted him at all. But he wouldn't dwell on that. He was lucky. And he knew it. Tamira steps out of the shower and wipes a small spot in the mirror above the sink so he can see his reflection. He eyes his scarred face and chest and hates what he sees. He quickly dries himself off and throws on the black t-shirt to cover himself. Once fully dressed, he takes a minute to brush out his long, white hair. Sitting on the counter next to the sink is a pair of gloves that Tamira sometimes wears. They only cover his pinky and ring finger and have a small buckle around his wrist to keep the gloves in place. He doesn't wear them often, but they're a good idea when he can't control his emotions. Not wanting to have any embarrassing accidents in front of Midoriya, he puts the half-gloves on before leaving the bathroom. Upon exiting, he sees Midoriya sitting cross-legged in the middle of Tamura's bed, looking at something on his phone. He doesn't look up when Tamura steps into the room. He sees the man sitting on his bed, unsure of what he should do or say next. Eventually, Midoriya looks up at him with a blank expression. Tamira has him completely closed out of his mind right now, so he can't hear what the hero thinks as he looks at him. Part of him wants to open the connection again, but he's afraid that Midoriya might catch wind of his thoughts, and he really doesn't want that. Do you want to watch a movie or something? Tamira asks. Oh, um, yeah, sure, Midoriya says. He puts his phone on the little table by the bed before scooting on the mattress to make room. Tamira sits next to him after turning off the lights in the room and grabbing the TV remote, which he hands to Midoriya. You can put on whatever you want, Tamura tells him. He pulls the comforter over his legs, and Midoriya does the same. They're sitting with their backs against the bed's headboard, which sits in the center of the room. The TV is on the wall at the foot of the bed, which comes to life as Midoriya starts to click the buttons on the remote. He navigates to one of the streaming channels on the TV. You don't care what we watch? Midoriya asks tentatively. The movie he selected is some cheeky-looking hero movie. I really don't care, Tamura says, and Midoriya smiles at him before turning his attention to the TV. Tamura swears his heart almost burst. It's been a while since he's seen Midoriya smile, which made Tamura happy. He smiles softly as Midoriya hits play on the movie and cozies himself into the bed. While the hero keeps his eyes fixed on the screen, Tamira can't help but let his eyes wander to the man lying in the bed next to him. He blushes when he realizes that Midoriya is the first person he's ever had in his bed besides himself. They're not even 30 minutes into the movie before Midoriya falls asleep beside Tamira. While the movie continues to play in the background, Tamira continues to keep an eye on Midoriya. He's lying on his side, facing Tamira, and he watches as the hero sleeps. Now that he's sleeping, Tamira can look all he wants at Midoriya's face without getting caught staring. His eyes trace the sleeping hero's face, eyeing his freckles illuminated in the movie's soft glow. His face is relaxed, and he looks soft and vulnerable, which makes Tamura's stomach twist. He actually feels comfortable enough around him to fall asleep in his presence. 
he isn't sure how to feel about this. As the movie continues to play, Tamura sinks farther into the bed, resting his head on the pillow next to Midoriya. He reaches out a hand to touch his face, but abruptly stops himself when he realizes what he's doing. He wants to trace his fingers along his eyebrows, cheeks, and nose and touch his freckles. He wants to draw lines between the dots on his face and pick out the constellations hiding within them. He just wants to touch Midoriya, but he doesn't. He wonders if he should wake him when the movie ends, but he refrains when the credits start rolling. He turns off the TV, deciding to let Midoriya stay the night. It doesn't take long before Tamura is also drifting off to sleep. Asterisk, 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 Tamura wakes in the middle of the night and feels a heavy weight on his chest. He looks down, and his face is immediately buried in soft green hair that smells like Tamura's shampoo. He breathes in, noting the hints of Midoriya's scent hiding within the shampoo's musky scents. He wishes that Midoriya hadn't used his soaps so that Tamura could smell the hero and nothing else. Midoriya's head rests on Tamura's chest, and his arms are wrapped around his middle. Their legs are tangled together under the blankets, and Tamura is careful not to move so that he doesn't wake him. He knows that whenever Midoriya wakes up, he'll probably pull himself away from Tamura. Against his better judgment, Tamura carefully lifts his hand and buries his fingers in Midoriya's soft curls. He likes the way they feel beneath his hand. The hero breathes softly as he sleeps, and Tamura can feel the rise and fall of his chest as he inhales and exhales. He continues to run his hand through Midoriya's hair. But then, Midoriya stirs. Tamura freezes, not even wanting to move so much as to pull his hand from the sleeping hero's hair. Midoriya moves around a bit, letting out a sleepy groan as his arms tighten around Tamura. Once he's absolutely sure that the man on top of him is still sleeping, he eases his hand away from Midoriya's hair and wraps his arms around his waist. Not long after, Tamira falls asleep again and has what he believes is the best night of sleep he's had to date. When Izuku wakes up, he has a mini freak out. He forgot that he had gone to Shigaraki's house the previous night, so he was startled when he found himself in bed with someone. Once he realized where he was and who he was in bed with, he calmed down. Then, he freaked out again. He was lying on Tamira Shigaraki. Not only that, but Izuku's sweatshirt had ridden up sometime in the night, and Shigaraki's hands were around his waist, his fingers holding onto Izuku's hips tightly. It makes Izuku's heart race, and his cheeks heat up. Izuku lays as still as possible as he tries to think of a way to slide himself off Shigaraki without waking him. The last thing he wanted was for Shigaraki to wake up and find Izuku like this. It would be so embarrassing. Izuku carefully starts to unwrap his arms from around the other man, but he freezes when he stirs in his sleep. Shigaraki shifts underneath Izuku and lets out a sleep-addled moan as his hands tighten on Izuku's hips. His fingers dig into his flushed skin, causing Izuku's skin to pebble underneath his touch. Before the hero can stop himself, he lets out a breathy sound, his body reacting all on its own. As Izuku carefully tries to shift away from Shigaraki, fear, unlike any other, strikes his heart when he feels his blood rushing south, causing the length between his legs to harden. Fuck. 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 Izuku is up in a flash, no longer caring if he wakes Shigaraki. He thinks that maybe if he moves away from him fast enough, He'll have put enough distance between the two of them before Shigaraki fully wakes and realizes what had happened. Shigaraki is starting to wake up, but Izuku has already opened the bedroom door and is planning on making a speedy departure. He's sure that Shigaraki didn't mean for him to sleep here. It would be an awkward conversation, and he was not prepared to have it. Izuku. Shigaraki says in a low, sleepy voice, and by the fucking gods, the sound of Izuku's name on that man's tongue is not helping his situation. He's never called him by his first name before, and... No, nope. Keep walking, Izuku, he tells himself. As he rushes down the stairs and out of the house, 
He slams his mental shields down, making sure to keep Shigaraki out of his head. He knows that the former villain likes to poke around, and Izuku never ever wants Shigaraki to know anything about what had transpired while he'd been asleep. Izuku returns to his apartment in record time, skipping the front door altogether and landing on the balcony to let himself in. He slides open the glass door and slips inside. When he turns around, he's immediately slapped in the face with the sight of Kaminari on his knees in front of Shinsu, who's got his pants around his ankles. Shinsu looks equally as mortified as Izuku, but Kaminari is none the wiser to his presence. Izuku has never turned around and left anywhere quicker in his life. He's now walking the streets, unsure of where to go. He's still got Shigaraki blocked from his mind, since Izuku's thoughts haven't cooled down yet, and the image from his apartment is burned into the back of his eyes. He pats his pockets and realizes he'd left all of his personal belongings at Shigaraki's during his quick escape, which includes both his hero suit and his phone. Izuku sighs sticks his hands in Shigaraki's sweater pockets, and trudges down the streets. He figures it might be safe if he gives his roommate an hour or so before returning. This time, he'll use the front door and knock before entering. He doesn't even know what time it is, but he can tell it's somewhere around noon. Izuku can feel Shigaraki trying to push into his head, but he ignores it. He supposes he can always reach out later once he's figured himself out. Shigaraki will just have to wait until then. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk Tamura is pacing the length of his bedroom when a knock at the door startles him from his thoughts. He'd been trying to reach out to Midoriya, but for the first time, he was completely locked out of the hero's mind. Shigi, I'm coming in. Himiko calls before opening the door. She comes in with her arms crossed over her chest, no smile in sight. Tamura can only look at her. He's still freaking out about Midoriya's rushed departure, wondering if letting the hero fall asleep like that was the wrong move. What happened? She finally asks. The poor guy ran out of here like he'd seen a ghost. We slept in the same bed, Tamura says quietly. And, she asks, tapping her fingers on the forearm she has crossed over her chest. And what? That's all that happened. Tamura's face is as red as a tomato, and he can feel his pulse picking up as he thinks about it. He'd never been close to someone before like that. It was. Hamiko interrupts his train of thought with her boisterous laughter, and it takes a few seconds for her to calm down enough to speak again. If that's all that happened, why are you freaking out? It's written all over your face, and I can hear you muttering and pacing from the hall. It makes you sound like him a little. He obviously wasn't happy about it, Tamura snaps. He got up and left all his shit here. I can't even call him a friend yet, and I've already scared him off. Nothing about this is funny. It is funny, she chuckles. You have a crush on him, don't you? I know I was teasing before, but I totally see it now. You are down bad for Deku. Tamira neither confirmed nor denied this statement. His hand twitched with the desire to itch his neck, and so he reached up and started to scratch. His heart was still pounding in his chest, and he wasn't sure what to do. He pushes against the bond and can still feel Midoriya blocking him out, which scares him. The brat never blocked him out, so Tamira must have majorly screwed things up by letting the hero sleep here. Just talk to him about it. I'm sure he's feeling just as nervous as you are about this, judging by his reaction this morning. I can't talk to him, Tamira says. He's blocked me out of his mind. He left his phone here. Well, here's your opportunity. Go bring it back to him. Before Tamira can tell her off, she's gone, and he's standing alone in his room again. He groans and flops back down in his bed, sucking in a deep breath. He can still smell Midoriya on his pillows. Tamura groans again. He tries Midoriya one last time and pushes against the walls the hero has put around his mind. Just like every other time he's tried that morning, he's still being pushed away. Tamura groans a third time before getting up out of his bed totally 
not after he inhales Midoriya's scent on the sheets first. Asterisk, 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 Izuku was finally back in his own apartment. After a very awkward hello to his roommate, they pretended nothing had happened. Izuku sat on his bed, trying to get his thoughts to slow down. He hasn't even been up for three hours, and he's already had one hell of a day. He fidgets with his fingers as he mutters to himself, trying to figure out what to do about the whole situation. Shigaraki hasn't stopped trying to get inside his head, and it's undoubtedly to talk about what happened this morning. Izuku knew he was clingy in his sleep, and he was absolutely mortified on Shigaraki's behalf that it happened. He can hear Shinsu and Kaminari talking in the living room and telling by Kaminari's expressive behavior. He still had no idea that Izuku had seen them like that. Honestly, he preferred it that way. He could deal with Shinsu. It wouldn't have been the first time either of them had caught the other in a compromising position, and being roommates, it certainly wouldn't be the last. It was just an unfortunate cherry on top of Izuku's pre-existing shit Sunday. A knock sounds on Izuku's bedroom door, and he gets up to see who it is. It's Shinsu on the other side, and a very unsure-looking Kaminari is standing behind him. Izuku eyes Shinsu with confusion. Someone's at the door for you, Midoriya, Shinsu says, his tone steady but low as if he's on edge. Izuku honestly can't tell if his roommate is glaring at him or not. But the look on Kaminari's face worries him, and the tension in the air was thick enough to scoop into a bottle. He walks past the couple and heads for the door. When he arrives, he's surprised to see a nervous-looking Shigaraki standing in the doorway. He's giving Izuku an unreadable expression, and Izuku feels his face heat up. Oh, um, hi, Izuku says his voice small. You left your stuff at my house, the former villain tells him. He shakes off the backpack he was wearing and hands it over to Izuku. Your hero suit and your phone. The floor creaks behind Izuku, and he whips his head around to see Shinsu standing behind him. You're not here to cause trouble, are you? Shinsu shoots. He's staring daggers at what he believes to be a villain standing on his doorstep. Oh, no, Shinsu. Um, Shigaraki and I are, Izuku cuts himself off, not really sure what they are exactly. Friends, Shigaraki says. He left some stuff at my house. I just came by to bring it back. Shinsu looks between his roommate and the man at the door with wide eyes, obviously unsure of what to think about this development. And in Shinsu's defense, Izuku isn't sure what to think about it, either. We obviously need to talk. Shishu sighs, pinching the bridge of his nose. You can't just give our address out to, Shinsu pauses, obviously amending what he was about to call the man at the door. Strangers, he finishes. He's not a stranger, Izuku says in rebuttal. He looks back at Shigaraki. Do you want to come in? He doesn't know why he's inviting Shigaraki inside. After all, he'd only come to drop Izuku's stuff off but perhaps Izuku wanted to prove something to his roommate. It was apparent that Shinsu disapproved of Shigaraki being here, but Izuku wanted to reassure him that the man at the door was trustworthy. Well, Izuku trusted him, at least. I don't want to overstep, Shigaraki says, looking past Izuku and at Shinsu. I know this must be weird to you, so I don't want to barge in or anything like that. Shinsu lets out a sigh and Izuku holds his breath, hoping that his roommate will approve. Fine, Shinsu says after a few seconds. You can come in. I don't care. Izuku wastes no time and grabs Shigaraki by the arm, dragging him inside. He closes the front door before leading his visitor to his room. Once inside, Izuku leans against the door and lets out the breath he'd been holding. I don't want to be here if it makes your roommate uncomfortable, Shigaraki says. I get it. I know that not everyone is as trusting as you. You're not a villain, Izuku tells him sternly. Quit letting people treat you like one. Their opinions toward me aren't based on nothing, Shigaraki retorts. I don't care. You're different now. You said it yourself earlier we're friends. 
That means I want my other friends to be okay with me having you around, alright? Shigaraki sighs and sits down on the edge of Izuku's bed. You have a lot of All Might merch, he laughs, looking around the hero's room. I'm a fanboy. What can I say? Izuku says sheepishly as he rubs the back of his head. Thank you for bringing my stuff over. How do you know where I live, anyway? I don't remember telling you. I'm constantly inside your head. You didn't need to tell me, he replies. A tense silence passes between them. Izuku continues to hover by the door while Shigaraki sits on the hero's bed, his eyes looking everywhere but Izuku. Can we talk about this morning? Shigaraki finally asks. Izuku's heart races in his chest. Why, yeah, sure. Izuku pulls the chair from his desk and angles it toward Shigaraki before taking a seat. Before the other can say anything, Izuku starts the conversation. I'm really sorry about what happened. I know I tend to be clingy in my sleep, and I didn't even mean to fall asleep, let alone all cuddled up to you. And I know I probably made you feel uncomfortable, so I'm really sorry about that. Izuku's apology is a mess, and he turns bright red as he realizes how poorly he's handling this. Shigaraki does nothing but stare at the floor as Izuku continues to word vomit at him. I really appreciate you inviting me over and all, and I'm really sorry I overstayed my welcome like that and made you uncomfortable. Midoriya, Shigaraki says sternly, cutting off the hero. I, I wasn't uncomfortable. Izuku's head is spinning now. Oh, I mean, Shigaraki starts, and Izuku notices a faint blush across the man's cheeks. I just ugh, I don't even know how to say it. Izuku remains silent and waits for Shigaraki to finish his thought. He's afraid that if he starts talking again, he won't stop. His nerves are going haywire, and he isn't sure what to think anymore. He wants to ask Shigaraki what he means by that, but he doesn't want to make anything weirder than it already is. What I mean to say is that I liked having you over, Shigaraki finally says, his voice quiet but steady. I liked sleeping in the same bed as you. Oh. Oh. Shit. Izuku's face is burning even more now. He clenches his hands into fists in his lap and tries to calm his heart rate. He doesn't even know how to respond to Shigaraki. He must have stayed quiet for too long because Shigaraki is now getting up from the bed and heading toward the door in a hurry. This is stupid. Fucking stupid, he's muttering under his breath. Izuku's chest aches when he sees the man trying to leave, and before he can think about what he's doing, he stands up and grabs Shigaraki's hand, tugging him closer. Wait, Izuku desperately calls. Izuku stumbles over the edge of the carpet and falls forward, landing against Shigaraki's chest. He's still holding his hand while the other reaches out and latches onto his former nemesis's shirt tightly to keep himself from falling. Shigaraki throws his arm around the hero's waist, helping him steady himself. Izuku looks up, and their eyes lock. He lets out a quick exhale, and Shigaraki tenses, his breath audibly catching in his throat. Izuku is no longer thinking about anything else as he stares into Shigaraki's crimson eyes, which seem to pierce straight through him. Everything around them seems to pause. Suddenly, Shigaraki pulls Izuku around and presses him against the door, roughly grabbing the hero's chin to angle his face up toward his. He presses his forehead against Izuku's, and his hands begin to tremble. For the first time all day, Izuku's mind is completely blank. Not a single thought is flying through his head anymore. All he can think about is how close Shigaraki is, and how his breath feels as it skates across Izuku's lips. He parts his lips slightly, absentmindedly running his tongue across his bottom lip. Please, Shigaraki whispers, barely audible. Please, please. Izuku's head is fuzzy, and his chest feels warm, pressed up against Shigaraki like this. He can only think of one thing Shigaraki might be begging him for. So, he leans forward and presses their lips together softly. Shigaraki's lips are surprisingly soft and warm. Fireworks are going off in his head, 
and his hands desperately reach out, wanting to touch the man before him. The kiss starts slow, but gradually becomes faster and hungrier as it goes on. Shigaraki bites down on Izuku's bottom lip, drawing out a soft whimper from the hero's throat. This only seems to fuel Shigaraki, and he slips his tongue inside the hero's mouth and starts to explore. Izuku lets out another soft noise and pushes his tongue roughly against Shigaraki's. Izuku's hands eagerly roam the other man's body, desperate to map out every dip and angle with his fingertips. He wants more. Izuku wants more. That's all he can think about when Shigaraki's hands slip under the hem of Izuku's sweatshirt and run across his abdomen and chest. The kiss is hot, like an inescapable fire that the two find themselves caught in. Izuku was wholly captured and consumed by the flames, and he wouldn't have it any other way. Shigaraki shifts his stance, putting his leg between Izuku's thighs, and Izuku moans into Shigaraki's mouth when his growing erection rubs up against his leg. The hero presses his hips harder against the other man, searching for that perfect friction as he begins to rut against Shigaraki's thigh. Izuku moans again. A little louder this time when Shigaraki pushes against him. But then, Shigaraki freezes. He detaches his lips from Izuku's, and the hero lets out a dissatisfied whimper as he chases after the lips that just left his. Before Izuku can collect himself in any capacity, the door behind him opens just a crack, and Shigaraki slides through and closes it behind himself. Izuku, completely dumbfounded, leans against the door and tries to catch his breath. Then, the reality of what just happened hits him all at once. Shit, he breathes. Shit, shit, shit. Shigaraki had left him standing there alone in his room. He left without saying anything. Had Izuku made him feel uncomfortable? Did he do something wrong? He was trying to piece together what had just happened. But all he could think about was how into it Shigaraki had seemed. But maybe he wasn't. Perhaps that was just Izuku's imagination. He sinks to the floor, puts his head in his hands, and tugs at his hair. He tries to reach out to Shigaraki through the bond, hoping to get some answers. But he is completely locked out. A sinking feeling spreads throughout Izuku's chest, and he struggles to slow his breathing. He'd obviously done something he wasn't supposed to. And now everything was even more messed up than when he'd left it this morning. Still, he couldn't figure out what he'd done wrong. He clenches his fists in his hair, tugging at the strands as he tries to calm his racing heart and mind. Tears prick at the corners of his eyes. He'd messed everything up. He'd messed it up. Again. Asterisk, 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 Tamira rushes home and closes himself in his bedroom. He had kissed Midoriya. He actually kissed him. And Midoriya kissed him back. He's freaking out internally and externally as he paces the length of his room, his hands still shaking from the encounter. It was so overwhelming for him. It was his first kiss. He has never kissed anyone before. Between all of the abuse and villainy, Tamira never really found time to engage in that kind of stuff with people. He presses his fingers to his lips, remembering how Midoriya's lips felt against his. And the sounds. The sounds that Midoriya made should be illegal. They were more addicting than any drug on the market. All Tamira wanted right now was to hear more of them. But everything had just been way too overwhelming. If he hadn't left, he was afraid that he wouldn't have been able to stop. His erection was still straining against the fabric of the pants he wore and it twitched when he thought of Midoriya rutting against him. It was absolutely intoxicating and entirely too much. After calling himself down a little, he suddenly realizes what he just did to Midoriya, the thought washing over him like ice-cold water. He kissed him like that, and then he just left without explanation. What the hell is wrong with me? Tamira thinks to himself. He's suddenly panicking and instantly tries to reach out to Midoriya through the bond, but finds himself blocked out. Midoriya had tried to reach him on Tamura's way back, but he'd shut him out. His heart sinks when he realizes that he might have upset Midoriya. 
He keeps pushing and trying to get Midoriya to let him in, but it's not working. He scratches at his neck and keeps trying Midoriya over and over. He pushes and strains against the hero's mental blocks until Tamira feels his head start to ache. It's evident that he's not going to get through to him. His heart drops, and he hangs his head in his hands, hoping he didn't just screw himself over. 